so I will call the meeting to order. Um, <clears throat> John, if you're trying to talk to me, you're muted. So, uh, no, okay. Um, to get started, I uh, just talk a little bit about meeting logistics. Anyone who's joining remotely, please change your name display to your first and last name so all of us can know who's uh, who's talking to us. Um, <clears throat> when you speak, please uh, begin by stating your name and where you live. We ask you to keep your comments to, and your questions to under three minutes. Uh, anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. Um, and anyone who speaks out of turn or discusses non-germane topics goes on too long, maybe uh, asked to stop. And as always, we will have the assistance of Councillor Bate to keep track of the time. And she's got her signs. Excellent. And I think the yellow sign means you have one minute left and red sign means you are out of time and you must stop talking. All right. Next item on the agenda is to, first item is to approve the agenda. Any changes to the agenda? I'm not hearing any, okay. Tim. I just had the one question I brought up this morning about um, plan purchase. Yep, we will we'll get to that uh, when we come to the consent agenda. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on anything that any topic that's not on the agenda. And as always, we ask the, that you keep your comments to three minutes. Uh, please either physically raise your hand or indicate uh, on your Zoom connection that you uh, be recognized. Bill, are you raising your hand or not? Well, just Mr. Mayor, I wanted to remind you that because it's a remote meeting that all oh, the members of the yes. council should identify themselves. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, glad, I, glad you caught that. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, Jack McCullough, mayor, and I'll just uh, go down the room the way we uh, the way we people sit. So starting with Palin Cohn. Hi, Palin Cohn, District 2. Uh, Lauren Hurl, sorry. <laughs> Lauren Hurl, District 1. Uh, Tim? Tim Heaney, District 3. Uh, Sal? And you're muted. Sal Alfano, District 2. Uh, Carrie? Carrie Brown, District 3. And Donna? Uh, Donna Bate, District 1. Okay, thank you. Now, is anyone asking to be recognized for general business and appearances. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. And before we take up the consent agenda, We've had a couple of questions uh, raised regarding item D, landed acquisition to be added to Berlin Pond. So we will take that off the consent agenda. And then uh, are there any other items that should be taken off the consent agenda? Okay, chair would entertain a motion, uh, Donna. I'll make a motion that we accept the consent agenda with D removed. Second. Okay. All right, and it's moved and seconded. All those in favor? Any any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the consent agenda with the exception of item D is approved. So now, Bill, do you want to give us a little bit about item D? Sure. A year or so ago, uh, maybe two now, we were approached uh, by a group uh, in seeking to conserve land in Berlin Pond, knowing the city has an interest in purchasing land for uh, water shed safety and protection. About acquiring four parcels, uh, the city council agreed to this and agreed to put in a maximum of $80,000 to do that. The city uh, actually purchased the first parcel 
uh, with that $80,000. The remainder was to be raised through grants, et cetera. Uh, so this is the rest of that purchase. Uh, it's being raised through uh, VHCB and Vermont Land Trust and other funds um, and has gone through all the processes. They've checked in, I think, with the council a couple times with the conservation easement, et cetera. And it's finally scheduled for closing tomorrow. And this is the last approval, the formal approval we have to give and authorize the mayor to sign all the documents they're prepared to sign. We've actually received the money from VHCB already uh, to the city. So we can then cut the check tomorrow. Uh, so that's basically where the city's not putting any money into this particular purchase. We, this was our, we've already paid our match to all of this. And this will complete this project, which has been going for a couple of years. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Donna and then not, Karen. Not a question. I just salute that we finally completed it. It was a goal and we did it and that we again had wonderful grant money, other organizations supporting this. So I thank the staff for executing it. And Terry. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is fantastic. Thank you. And I was not around for the beginning of this process. So I appreciate the update. Um, I think it's always helpful to include all of this inform all the updating information and the past history in at every step of the way, even though it seems like, yes, the city council did this and they did this and they did this. And mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, just, so, you know, I, I completely agree with that. And, and, you know, we got questions from two other council members today and I, I feel badly about that. We actually got all these documents right on Friday, and it was like, we got to do them and the closings Thursday and we were rushing just to get the material on the agenda. And of course we had everything else going on. And uh, I meant to send out a, uh, the backup information this week. And to be honest with you, they never, I, I forgot it. This is totally on me until Tim and then Sal asked today, like what's going on with this? And I'm like, yep, that's, that's right. They, you would know that. So I, I am sorry and happy to provide the explanation. I still would like it at some point. I don't have to oh, yeah. tonight because it sounds like a good thing. But to be honest, I appreciate the previous council approved it. But if we have to give final approval tonight, we should be in for the information so we can mm -hmm. make decisions to do these approvals. Yep, I agree. Really, I, I, it doesn't feel great. Okay, we would now uh, sell. Uh, are there is there anywhere where the, uh, the where these parcels are mapped so we can just see see where they are just in case we're at, where would we go to find that? Yeah, we'll send you everything tomorrow. We'll give you all the uh, you know Tim's right. We'll send you all the backup info tomorrow. Um, Great, and, thank you. Uh, you should have that absolutely. So, okay. Any other questions or discussion? And. I'll also open it up to the public and I'm not seeing any hands raised in the public. So I would entertain, entertain a motion to approve item D. I'd Don. make a motion to approve item D, land acquisition. And is second. There a second? Okay, moved and seconded. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? I'd like to abstain because I really don't have the information. Okay. Do you think that this recalls for a roll call because with an abstention bill? I don't know. It's always safer to do it. Yeah. Why, why don't we do it? Uh, Bates. Aye. Brown. Aye. Alfano. Aye. Mahini. Abstain. Cohn. Aye. Pearl. Aye. Okay, great. We are set on that. And we can move on to title or item six, uh, the uh, the city property tax rate. Is that so this this is pretty will? straightforward. Uh, you have the calculation in front of you. This is based on approved budgets, the approved the new grand list, um, and the uh, education tax rate. Um, so th this is really what we have to do to approve the tax rate. I, you know, we do have um, still some grievances to go, and I think probably more significantly, I'm sure there will be some abatement applications. Um, but we can't. I don't think we're allowed to uh, sort of increase the tax rate to 
uh, cover abatement. So I think we, we need to plan on uh, some shortfall in tax revenue this year. Um, and I know we have at least one major uh, property owner that's appealing their tax their assessment and may appeal it all the way to the state or to court. So um, national life. So um, that could have a significant impact. But at this point, this is the grand list that was filed as of now. And this is the approved budget. So it's really a, a math calculation. And we can't send out the tax bills until we vote. Correct. Yes. Any uh, questions from the members of the council? Probably. Any, go ahead, Tim. We should probably move approval for discussion purposes. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'll make the motion. I'll okay. second. All right. Um, now, any discussion? A um, couple quick questions, Bill, if it's all right. Sure. Um, so just kind of toward the end, in June, there was a few uh, soft comments about you were managing uh, expenses as we moved toward the end of the year. And it sounded a little, I guess, because with the flood and everything that's happened in the last 40 days or so, um, how did we end up? 2023 were, were we even in the hole it, it sounded like we're, we're, we're definitely in, a, in the hole we don't have a final number yet sarah i'll turn this right over to the finance director okay uh with the flood uh we had to relocate finance so we really are about a month behind um where we had hoped to be on reconciling um there's still a significant amount of adjustments left um to be made to the books i do expect it will be a deficit um, that was in excess of the amount that was presented in the May budget actual. Um, at the end of May, it was 408000 So um, my expectation is that it will be in excess of that. I just don't know exactly what that number looks like yet without um, some significant work to reconcile the books. Um, and we also have delayed the audit. We next week would normally be doing the audit. Uh, but with the flood, we just wouldn't be ready. Um, so our, our plan is to have field work in November now. I also want to clarify one thing um, because Tim asked and I used the, the term in the hole. Um, the, it's a bud, the budget shortfall for the, the last year would be, that would be the deficit, that budget deficit, but there was, there's sufficient reserve above that to cover that. So the city is not in the hole, so to speak, but the, so just make sure that those are, you know, there's an annual budget deficit and then there's a total overall fund and fund balance. So our general fund balance reserve will go down as a result of last year's budget. And then this year, um, you know, you've heard me say this and I've written it, but just again, to say it, um, you know, we will get tax abatements, which will reduce the tax revenue with the tax rate we're about to set. And we're not getting, you know, parking and we're not getting rooms, meals and alcohol. Um, so, you know, we are not in a robust shape this year. So we have put a pretty hard hiring freeze on in real essential purchases, at least until we get a better handle on insurance and FEMA reimbursements and all of those kind of things. Because our outflow is obviously all toward flood recovery right now. Okay, anything else? Tim, did you have another question or comment or is that good for you? I guess my only the question was the flood was it, and I guess just too early to know the numbers bill or have any sense. Yeah, yeah. We will, we're working on that. Um, you know, obviously our own specific damages as well as um, citywide. Uh, you know, for non, you know, at least estimates of private damage as well. We are meeting with FEMA um, next week. I'll we'll go over that a little bit when we get to that agenda item, but and start putting that together. So we hope to have a little bit more. Again, Sarah can maybe walk us through how that process works. But, you know, until we, we know we have, for example, significant damage here in City Hall, but we haven't priced out what it's going to cost us yet. So we can guess what got hurt, but we don't know what the replacement's going to be. Probably uh, like a lot of people. <laughs> exactly. Do um, you have any other questions or comments from members of the council? Yes, Sal. And you are muted. Yeah, so what happens if uh, the tax rate turns out to be insufficient? Uh, we have a revenue shortfall 
um, that we discover, you know, sometime in the next few months? Great question. Um, we have to adjust our budget, basically. Um, you know, and or and or continue drawing from reserves, um, but you know we, we don't. We'd rather not do that. Uh, the the best example I can give you, the most recent uh, example we had to do that was during COVID, not that long ago, and um, so we went through and we you know canceled a lot of projects and we uh, canceled a lot of programs. And um, in in that particular instance, uh, we had a benefit. Not that COVID was a benefit to anybody, but we had a benefit that. The federal government and state government allowed, uh, they added the amount of unemployment to, to people. They, they put an amount of payment on top of it and, and they made an exception that you could put people on unemployment but still keep their benefits. Normally you're not allowed to do that. So we were able to furlough, I think up to 25% of our workforce uh, for a fairly significant time and they were making about the same, uh, in some cases I think even maybe a little bit more than what they were making for us on unemployment and still keep their benefits. So that allowed us to um, not have to make payroll payments. We don't we don't have that opportunity this time. So uh, it's it's a it's a little bit of a different ball game. So we're we're watching things pretty closely, Lynn. So you know hiring freezes are imperfect because they're random. They're not strategic, right? They're not like this is where we want to make reductions. But uh, nonetheless, that's where we're starting right now. Is uh, not filling vacant positions and then taking it from there. We're hopeful we won't have to do layoffs, but that obviously could be something. Anybody else? And any comments or questions from members of the public? And I'm not seeing any. Tim, were you raising your hand again? I don't want to overlook anyone who wants to be heard. Okay, are we ready for a vote? It's been moved and seconded already. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Now we can move on to flood recovery discussion. Thank you, Mr. Oops. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we don't have, you know, a real set agenda here, but we do have an outline. We thought it was important. You know, it's been a lot. We, we've had a couple of community meetings, so some of the things we wanted to talk about, in whatever order you're interested in, was, uh, you know, if if the council wants to debrief at all from the community, the last two community meetings, it was a good time to do that. Our team did this morning. We wanted to provide a an update on city activity sort of from the flood to now, or at least a high level update uh, in part to maybe address some of the perhaps misunderstandings that have come out about things the city did or didn't do. Uh, and then uh, provide an update on city hall, not that there's anything concrete, but just where we're at. Uh, talk about downtown to the extent that we can, what we know about FEMA. Uh, I think we there's been questions about the home buyout program and what that is. So Mike, I think is prepared to provide some information on that. And again, provide some more clarity on the background of the flood hazard and river corridor regulations. We've had an internal question about city committee work um, just because of the staff allocation to that and whether it makes sense to, you know, to suspend some of them or not. So we wanted to ask that question. Uh, and, and then of course, anything else that anybody else wanted to ask or talk about uh, when you're in the line of the flood. It's obviously our biggest issue. We will need to get back to some other agenda items uh, uh, you know, soon, but we thought uh, while this is still fresh in everyone's mind, we should really devote tonight to that topic. And then maybe come September, start putting on other things on the agenda. So that's where we're at. Does anybody have anything else they want to Add or any anything they'd like to talk about first. If not, we'll just. I don't have a particular order in mind, Carrie. Yeah, I don't. Not to talk about first, but I want to add just the general topic of communications from the city, and you know, getting information out. And um, and I do want to talk about this ongoing issue of 
of um, people's requirements to move their utilities up from their basement onto their first floor. Yep. And so that so is so. So the communications we're certainly happy to happy to talk about that. And part of our summary was to go over at least what we did or didn't do, and answer any questions and figure out how we can improve those uh, in whatever people want to talk about. And then uh, the flood hazard and river corridor regulations. That is one of the topics we were going to talk about. So I think we'll be happy to talk about that as well. I know a lot of people have that on their mind. Well, perhaps the first thing we should do then, I'm just looking off the list I jot down here is if people want to talk about the two fabulous community meetings we had so far, huge turnout, a lot of engagement, um, a lot of good ideas coming forward, One, at least one more to go. Uh, any reactions, any thoughts? I know our team, uh, like I said, we spent a good hour or so on it this morning um, before we, we got into other things. So. Um, you all want to have a conversation, whether it include our staff or not, but however, if, if I think it's important to acknowledge that they happened and um, what, what we've taken from them so far. Lauren, it looks like you're raising your hand. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to echo, I mean, it, it's been so impressive and exciting to see so many people come out. I mean, the attendance has been really incredible and even just people putting ideas and thoughts into the Padlet and other tools. Um, and so I think that's great. I mean, there were a ton of ideas I heard that, you know, some that would make sense for the city to look into, some that other entities would probably make more sense as the, the venue. And I'm definitely um, happy to, um, if it's helpful, I mean, I know that the city staff is kind of sifting through this too, it sounds like, but trying to do some of that sorting of like which things make sense as like a package of things that seem realistic, knowing that we're in this, you know, both time and budget <laughs> shortfall uh, moment, but also like what are the things that the city could move forward with potentially um, that we could consider and what are things that it probably makes more sense as like a state policy thing or um, maybe a nonprofit or something might want to pick up and, and run with. So just wanted to offer, I'm happy to help do some of that thinking if that's useful for the city. Um, I I echo, I will echo Lauren, it, they were very good meetings, so I attended both, and I was with the uh, supporting downtown uh, group last night, and uh, some of the ideas might need uh, to hire new staff, or using current staff in different things, so my question would be, uh, is city, is city ready to fulfill the action items coming from this meetings. I think we have one more meeting is coming, right? So will it be enough uh, resource getting coming from city to um, complete all the requests? So I think to answer that question, um, there's a, a couple of ways to answer that question. Number one is we do need to see what the requests are and who the most appropriate group is. I think some, you know, engineering or some of those things may be better for the Army Corps of Engineers, state government. So I think a lot of the ideas, some of the ideas that we've heard mentioned, I think we're already doing. People may not realize it. So it might be either just communicating that we're doing it or improving how we're doing it so it's clearer what's happening. Um, there are a couple things. There are some uh, there's some recovery work that is actually covered by FEMA, and we're we're actually meeting with them about that this week to make sure we can cover that. So we we've been talking, and I was going to get to that, uh, and I've been in conversation with Waterbury about what they did after Irene and the, kind of the scope of work that they did, and uh, then we may have to look at some other funding water. I know Waterbury's Rebuild Waterbury Group actually got funded by other sources grants. And I think, you know, maybe that the Montpelier Foundation would be willing to put some money in to get that started. Um, so it may not be necessarily, you know, us having to take from a depleted city budget, but still find the resources to do that work. So it really depends, I think, on, on what the work is. And, you know, some of it isn't also going to all get done immediately, especially some of the more structural things. And we would then start budgeting for those in in time. And some of the more immediate things were, were already on and some are female.
No, Carrie. And then Sal. Yeah, so I think one of the things that, that has really struck me about both of these community meetings is the emphasis on the idea of democracy as being something that's really within the hands of the people. And so that's, excuse me, to mean that uh, many of the problems that we face are not going to be solved by the city, you know, the capital C city, that those of us who are living in the city have to do a lot of this work. And so there may be some things that we're going to rely on city government to do, but that um, I'm hoping that we can try to keep the emphasis off of we have this big problem and the city needs to solve it, so the city has to figure it out because that's not that's not practical. We don't in the within the city government, we don't have the um, the finances to be able to solve a lot of these problems. We have to use our influence to um, try to get money from the state and from the federal government, but also to do the work in in other ways and other sort of you know grassroots democracy ways. So I don't want the city staff to feel like, if we're identifying problems, we are expecting you to solve all of them. There may be some that are appropriate for the city staff to, staff to solve, but that's it's not necessarily everything. And so I think we need to be really careful about that and to be able to say like there, if we're talking about how to manage the the watershed that is, you know, we can't do that at the city level. <laughs> But we may be able to have some say in how that is done. And so we need to be just really clear about that. Thanks, uh, Sal. Well, I was looking for, a, I didn't know when I might bring this up, but it, it seems that maybe this is uh, the most appropriate time given Pellin's question. Um, but you know, when I was preparing for some of the meetings and just um, researching you know, flood, um, mitigation and resources, I came up, up across a report that was prepared in 2015 called the Vermont Economic Resiliency Initiative put together by a group uh, assembled by the Vermont Department of Housing and, and Community Development. Um, I mentioned it last night in the infrastructure group and I, I think I was the only one in the room that ever heard of it. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is, a lot of what we're doing now seems to have been done after Irene. I mean, not not precisely, of course, but a lot of work seems to have been put into uh, this report. It runs 750 pages, roughly. Um, there's a lot in there about river management. A lot of the topics we were discussing last night, and I just want to make sure that we're, you know, we're in a position to rely on work that's gone before and not duplicating effort. Um, Given that we have, you know, limited resources, um, do, does anyone uh, know the report that I'm talking about and, and remember? I mean, I, I didn't. I chanced upon it, so I, I know nothing about it uh, except since you know, since I've found it, I've been. Uh, I haven't read it all, but I've read a lot of it. We heard it. We were talking about it this morning in our report. We haven't read it all either, but we are aware that it exists. That's all I wanted to just make sure we knew it was there and see if what's of value uh, in there. It's a, it might be a starting place for some things. Yeah, that's good to know about. I, I wasn't aware of it myself, even though I, I was here for all, for all these previous floods, many of them, not 1927. We, no matter what some people think. <laughs> well, me, yeah, Donna. I mean, it came out of the Vermont. Uh, Commerce and Community Development Department is mm -hmm. who issued it. Uh, uh, Carrie? Yeah, so this is making me think about the idea that there's a lot of information out there. A lot of a lot of work has been done previously. This is not the first flood that Montpelier has had. It's not the first flood that Vermont has had. And so I'm kind of introducing a new topic here, but in the first week or so after this flood happened, there were a few things that popped up for me that, that I thought, boy, it would be great if the state had been able to provide this information. 
um, or if we had known this before, if we had a checklist or something, because we've gone through a version of this before and uh, we shouldn't have to reinvent this or relearn it every single time. And so I would love for, I don't know if this is a city council activity or if this is a staff activity or, or maybe both, but to be able to provide some kind of formal input to the state to say, this is what we would appreciate next time. We would like to know um, that FEMA requires us to separate our, our refuse. Um, and we would like to have a better understanding of what's going on with the dams or, you know, whatever it is. And, and to try to, to, to come up with a, a letter or some kind of formal input that says this would be really helpful for us to know next time. Because it feels like we're kind of making this up um, from scratch. Not all of it. I mean, you know, the city staff knew what they were doing. They knew what needed to be done. They went out and they did it. But as far as the public was concerned, there was some information that we could have gotten from um, uh, expertise that we we shouldn't be expected for city staff to have that was, you know, at, at a higher level from that. And I, I think we could give some input to the state to say, next time, this is what we would like to have. I think that's a great point. I think that one of the things that we've heard, we heard really at the very beginning was people getting confusing information about what has to be done for, you know, reopening a restaurant, what you have to replace, what you can just clean and call it good. And, and people need to know that because you don't want people to be wasting their time, effort, and money on, uh, on something that is going to have to be redone, just as one example. Uh, Donna. Well, I was thinking we could, along those lines, what Sal and Carrie shared, that we could actually give ourselves homework to study this Vermont Economic Regency Initiative uh, and other reports that we share among ourselves things that we found. And yes, we can tell the state much more after we've studied these things, what was really available, but not in one place. And that we need to have, like they have emergency, like Bill, you have your regular emergency preparedness trainings and scenarios. And we need to do that with our community. We need to have community meetings around this and trainings uh, that, that we're now really going to be much more proactive in trying to educate and make people aware and ourselves, of course, but to share it. Maybe some workshops around that. I can just share that we spent a good two hours as a leadership team this morning, you know, debriefing what went right, what went wrong, what what we thought we did well, what we could have done better, what what we didn't know, uh, you know, with the idea of you know for us to create our own after action report, share with the council public, of course, um, but also it included those kinds of things like what would it be, you know, what is it that would be good to know, uh, and, and you know if nothing or how to reach those. I mean, we did rely on the state EOC um, because that's what we're supposed to do in emergencies, and you know. I don't want to bash them. This was a statewide emergency. This wasn't just a Montpelier thing. So, you know, they were they were triaging us with everybody else, but there were some, you know, some delays in getting information out and unclear information. And some of it is, you know, as far as I can tell, it's unclear even from the subsequent agencies. I, you know, I found even dealing with FEMA, um, you know, we haven't always gotten consistent answers depending on who we're speaking with with FEMA. So I think you know, we as city have always been really reluctant to speak and say, this is what FEMA allows, because it may not be, depending on, you know, so we've always tried to say, well, here's how you get to FEMA, you know, here's how you get to these things. So, uh, and that puts us in a weird position, because I think people expect us to know these answers. So we are trying to put a summary of that. I see Evelyn's on, and we, did you want to add to that, Evelyn? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to echo just basically everything that Bill says is that um, the FEMA regulations regarding communication are extremely strict. And when I was sitting in on the debris, the first debris uh, consultation meeting that we had with the um, FEMA contractors, it, our eligibility, whether or not we received funding, came down to whether or not we use the correct word or verb tense. I mean, it is, it was extremely um, strict. So the, the communication that we were putting out was heavily um, 
weighted by that. Um, basically, everything that came out during uh, the flood after we had made contact with FEMA had to be um, put in, basically put in front of their eyes before we could send it out because it it they had explained that it would um, it would be part of the audit in a couple of years, and we have no idea who is going to be looking at that. And in what context are they going to be um, to look, looking at it? So for instance, a Facebook post could have meant the difference between us getting um, reimbursement or not. So just uh, you know, as we as we look back and say like, you know, what have we, could have we done different? Um, you know, this was obviously a, a learning experience for all of us. And uh, just, you know, knowing that ahead of time, going into the next disaster, um, like it's still going to be sort of a, a, a tempered process, but as uh, as we look, you know, as we look back, I think it's just important to to realize that there were severe um, restrictions in what we were able to say and when uh, when we were able to say it. So that must have delayed some of the communications that went out uh, by significantly yeah, by several days. In some areas, right, in, in things concerning FEMA. You know, just a good example is FEMA, FEMA will cover debris removal, but not trash or garbage removal. So we had, you know, once we learned that, we had to be extremely careful that any time we referred to it at any time in any public way was that we were talking about debris removal um, because, so, um, and they would, they objected. They said, if you tell people that they can put their trash out, you could be inel ineligible. So there's just those kinds of things that, uh, you know, you start these emergencies and you're on your own a little bit and start doing what you need to do. And then they come in and kind of say, well, okay. And they do give you a little bit of a pass for the first couple of days. Like, okay, you just did what you needed to do, but then like, okay, here's how this rolls. Uh, I mean, not, not every single bit of communication, but certainly things about anything to do with what might be recoverable. We have to be really careful. Carrie, I see you have your hand up again. Yeah, I I really appreciate that um, information, and I'm so sympathetic to you having to manage that. And um, I'm I'm wondering if you're thinking about kind of coming up with sort of a, a guide guidelines or handbook or you know how to handle this next time so that you know that so you don't have to if it's not the the people who are currently here on staff, maybe it's totally different people. So they don't have to learn that again. They can just know that that's what we have to do. And so to be able to not have to take a few days to figure that out, but to be able to just say, okay, from right off, we have to use the word debris. We cannot use the word trash. I'm, I'm hoping that you'll have that written down somewhere and recorded and maybe in some procedures and a manual. I don't, I don't know how you do things, but I think that would be very, very helpful. So we use those exact words this morning about needing to create a handbook and that, um, you know, everyone but Bob and I would be gone for the next one. Bob and I would still be here, but that uh, <laughs> it would be different people. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we uh, yes, that, is, that was, Carrie, it was like you were in our meeting this morning. I promise I did not actually have any inside information to that. No, I, 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 I didn't, think you did. I didn't mean to hours. imply that you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, Chief. Yeah, I, I, I just want to pass. I got an invite this afternoon from the National Weather Service inviting me to come on board. We're, they're, because of so the climate change is so rapidly changing, they're now looking at how we're going to respond to these things and how we're going to get the messages out. So I, I agreed to join that committee. And I think it's important to point out that climate change is so rapidly changing and these type of events are coming and they're coming more rapidly that we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get this message out. Um, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. The, this is all great. And I'm so glad that we've got the um, the feedback being captured from the city. Um, I do also um, love both Carrie and Donna's ideas. Like I think there is some formal feedback to the state from the city could be impactful. For example, um, I mean, I think there's probably a lot of things that have come out in the public process that we could kind of capture. Like one thing that's just on my mind is like, as an example is, 
the um, businesses have said, you know, and it was somebody had kind of mentioned this uh, a couple minutes ago, but like the um, feedback from the Department of Health about how to be dealing with um, you know, some of like the toxics and different products and that they basically were just kept getting pointed to a website that seemed really insufficient and that nobody from Department of Health was like available to talk to business owners, like they were calling. So I, I think like the feedback of like a more hands-on approach from the Department of Health could have been helpful or better, like more fleshed out resources with more examples or something. Um, so I think capturing some of that like community input that's different than just what the city did or experienced um, could also be helpful in it coming from the city instead of putting the onus on, you know, an individual business owner who wouldn't even know where to give that feedback probably. Um, and I imagine that homeowners probably have some similar feedback. So maybe there's like state examples of, you know, room for improvement <laughs> and, yep. uh, you know, some federal examples and then the city, um, our own kind of internal look at, with feedback from the community. Yeah, so those are on our list. Um, that is one of the areas we got a lot of feedback about. You know, we've been, the, the, the business community has been meeting every Monday. And, you know, we've been going, we've had city presence at all of them, including our building inspector, and that is um, high on the list. So we've, we've got that as something that, that we need to feedback on. You know, one of the things that I think happened was, um, and again, I'm not sure, you know, you're in this emergency and people are reacting and they're trying to do the best they can. And, you know, we, uh, you know, I think we did, we did do a lot of things well, but one of them was to have, I think, you know, Chief Gowans called uh, Department of Public Safety and said, you know, we need inspectors. So really the first day that it was dry down there, downtown, um, we had our building inspector plus, you know, seven other state or maybe it was eight state inspectors on scene in Montpelier and going through buildings and doing quick checks of electrical systems and all those kind of things. And I think Again, I, through no one's fault of their own, but basically they were checking to make sure the buildings were safe to be in. But people were, you know, a building inspector says, hey, you're good to go. You know, you're all set. You can go back in. I think people then interpreted that as, okay, I just need to clean up and reopen. And so there was a fair amount of effort of people who did that. And, you know, a couple of businesses almost got to the point of, being put back together and then additional information came like if the floodwaters hit your floor or your walls anything that was hit with the floodwater has to go and so you know the, while we had great we had great volunteer efforts some of it was maybe a little bit wasted because people cleaned out space that was just going to get ripped out anyway um, so I think learning more about that and just at least us putting that in our notes that if you have first floor flood first floor flooding you know be sure to know whether you need to rip it out before you make any any kind of things. And those were things that we learned from the Department of Health, Health later. The Department of Health did come to one of the one of those business meetings and answered a lot of questions and heard a lot of that feedback uh, from our our businesses. And I think you know it's 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 different for our, even for restaurants and for other places. So I think there's and, and really the answer for Department of Health is we don't have a boilerplate. We have to go into every business and see what happened in your situation. You know, is your cooler okay or did it get stuff in the insulate, you know? So um, it was helpful to know that, but I don't think it was helpful for people in this knowing, hey, you know, flood water washed up against my cooler, does it have to go or not? So, you know, it's a definite maybe. We have to come and look at it and tell you. So, but again, having a guide for people to know that even that's a process that that happens and that you've got to get that sign off before you can do anything, I think would be helpful. And it would have, uh, we would have been better able to communicate that to people. Okay. Carrie's yeah, I, I appreciate that. That's a great example. Um, and if there were a way to, I mean, maybe we could put together something in advance of the next flood. So we, we decide there's gonna be another flood like this. And so we get information out to people and sort of short of that, option B is whatever we know from now, we get out to people within the first 24 hours or so after it happens. And so similarly, this, um, you know, the, the, the flood hazard regulations that we have about moving things out of our basements, you yep. uh, proactively let people know about that before there's a flood. And then also, when there is a flood, to um, 
within the first 24 hours, sorry, my, my cat, <laughs> within mm -hmm. the first 24 hours, reach out to those people and, you know, just have a, a, a list set up in, in Word. So you just, you know, send out a letter to everybody that says, or an, an email, if you've got emails that says, you, before you do any work, you're going to need to know that you have to do this. Because um, we can't expect businesses and residents to know all of those details ahead of time. Now, going forward, people are going to know a lot because we're learning a lot through all of this. But that's one of the services that the city can provide is to get that information out ahead of time and then also both ahead of time and then also in that moment of the emergency to say, okay, we're leaving the requirements for permits, but you should know that to get a permit, you're gonna to need to move everything out of the basement or whatever it is. Uh, so completely agree with that. And I'd say a couple of couple of things, just practical matter. And again, these are these are not reasons not to do it. Well, they're obstacles, not reasons not to do it. So for one example, the mail was down. So we didn't have any mail for a few days. So sending out letters uh, and, and, you know, we've had a few people say, you know, we've had some feedback from people saying, you know, you should just send emails to everybody. Well, you know, unless we don't have everybody's email address, we have, an, you know, alert systems and we actually, are, you know, I think we're about 400 people have signed up. Um, and so the more we can get people to, be on our email list the more we can get that kind of stuff up quickly so yes it may even be door to door the other thing that happens and i i i don't want this is not meant to be complacent or anything but um you know you're right carrie people know now but in five years from now or 10 years from now they may know or they may forget or somebody else may own their home and so i guess part of the question is how do you get these things like as part of say you know people being notified of this. I know uh, Mike's on and he can maybe explain it uh, better, but I think, you know, letters were sent to everybody at the time, but, you know, we all get letters and set them aside and don't think about it again. So, uh, you know, I think those are all challenges. How do you keep these things in people's minds? Um, and to the extent that we have advanced notice that something's coming, getting that information up ahead of time is great. If it's an ice jam flood or something, you know, we have the kind of notice that we had with this one. Um, before, just on that topic, before I go back to Carrie and then Tim, uh, I, one of my brothers lives in Virginia Beach, and because they're so close to the naval base, every home in the in the city has a noise rating based on their location, their distance from the from where the jets are taking off, and and so anyone who buys a house in Virginia Beach knows. Uh, where they are and what noise they're exposed to. And we we know what all the properties are in the flood zone. So we could uh, have special information that anyone who buys a house in the flood, flood zone could get when they at the time of that transaction, just, just as a thought. So Carrie. Uh, that's pretty much exactly what I was gonna say. If we could build it into the process when you buy a house, that's in in the whatever it is and maybe it's not just this particular zone i mean that's what i'm concerned with because it affects me personally and that's what's going on right now but maybe there are other zoning regulations or other things that people have to be compliant with when you buy the house that's part of what you have to sign on to when you buy it so going forward so that people know about it and then also when possible letting people know in the aftermath of an emergency right Tim. Yeah, I yeah, the I think the advance notice in some ways was better for this storm than some previous ones. Um I know we didn't have one tenant lose a car, which is pretty impressive for an event like this. Uh, in the past with some of our properties, we've had numbers of tenants lose their vehicles. Um you know, it, 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 when the actual event's happening, I'm sure it's not that far back we all remember. I mean, you're out there in your mud boots and running pumps and you're not looking at emails and you're not getting letters. <laughs> um, that's just not real. Uh, I think ultimately days after you'll start to get those communications, but it's not gonna happen during the event. Um, and I guess my only other point is every event, and I've lived through a few too, but not 1927, uh, was um, 
<laughs> they're all different, you know, they're all mm -hmm. distinctly yeah. different and different things happen. So it is always a challenge to try to um, accommodate what's in front of you at the moment and deal with it the best you can. Um, it seems one thing I found with this one that's really so interesting compared to 92, which is the most similar event I can remember to this one, um, is I think our expectations are all very different now. And people's concern about mold and health issues and really good solid concerns. I gotta tell you, 92, a lot of that stuff that came out of these basements was there in 92. Uh, and it's, it's not funny, but um, it, I, I think, um, you know, our standards are different and we're dealing with it better. And, and I think a lot of people deserve credit for that. So that's all I'll say, thanks. I have a question for Tim while he still get the mic um, in your other hat. So when you, when you, as a realtor, when you're selling a house that's in the design review district or the floodplain or something like that, do you, what, what is conveyed to, to buyers? Uh, well, it's disclosed. It's on the form that it's in the floodplain. Uh, design review isn't as often, but we do make a point of discussing that. Yeah. And of course, if they're getting a mortgage, um, the bank will require a flood review of the flood status and probably require that they buy flood insurance to be able to get to obtain the loan. Thanks. Uh, Evelyn. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, Carrie, you are singing my communications tune. Um, one of the uh, projects that um, was uh, part of the, the conversation I had with the department heads early on when I started last year, um, it was actually uh, something that uh, Marty Lagerstead, uh, the assessor, uh, brought up in our conversation, and I, I, I've talked about it a couple of times after that, but um, is putting together a, a Montpelier operator's manual, basically, um, and that you would get as a, if you, if you purchased a new home or if you moved to the city, uh, and it would have that type of information, like here's what you need to know in case of an emergency. Here's where you can find information from the city. Here's who you can contact about X, Y, and Z. And so I just wanted to let you know that I am, that is one of the things that I am slowly adding to as um, I, as these things happen, basically, every time something uh, pops up and I'm like, oh, that should go in the operator's manual. I dump it in that folder. And uh, so it, it is in, it is in the works. And I just wanted to, to let you know that that's um, something that has been on, on my radar. Great. Uh, Sal. Well, I'm just uh, sitting here listening to this and thinking, you know, I'm not very good at mucking out basements, but um I can muck out information pretty good. So uh, thinking about what Donna was saying earlier, I'm, I'd be happy and maybe Evelyn I should talk with you directly about the kind of thing you're putting together. I, I love the idea of a, of a manual that's sort of in uh, plain English for you know the average person. Um, and I spent 30 years writing technical manuals. So uh, it's the kind of thing that you know I can put some time into. I don't have a day job. I do have grandchildren, but um, anyway, I, I'm offering myself as a resource uh, there. Uh, if there's any way I can help, um, don't hesitate to ask. And, and I'll uh, try to arrange a meeting next week. So maybe we can get down to details on that. That's great. Cool. Thank you. We will take you up on that. Uh, Tim. Um, a quick thought after I got off in Evelyn's comment was, you know, one group we haven't mentioned, we're talking about homeowners and property owners, but tenants were in this area were really heavily impacted too and there's really no focus for how to communicate with tenants and people who rent spaces whether it's businesses or their you know apartments where they live um, and I think probably from what I'm gathering from our tenants very very few carry any kind of insurance for this kind of situation so I think it's that's idea. definitely been a challenge you know I think for this flood and we're working with businesses to you know make changes for the next flood but for Montpelier Live has a pretty robust list of, you know, the business tenants, the, the vast majority of them. Mm -hmm. And so the, the most efficient way for us to communicate was to send our communications to them, to Katie, and she just forwarded them to her list. Boom. Um, and, and, you know, in some regards, that's more efficient than us, you know, maintaining a separate list because as businesses change, you know, we might, she might catch a change and we don't and those kind of things. It's almost better to have one list. But we are we are talking to the businesses about how that works best. But tenants have all you know it's always been, you know we we try to send stuff to building owners and 
you know, some of them like you are in town and others aren't. And, you know, how to contact tenants is always a thing. Maybe, you know, we could try to set up a tenant, something where somebody can sign up as a, as a tenant to get tenant information. We, we have that capacity now with our, our, our outreach system. So something we can think about. Because uh, I, I, that has, for as long as I've been here, that's been a missing link. Like, how do you hit the tenants? And sometimes, you know, if it's a notice of something, we just go put it on the front door of the building, but someone tears it down or, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, I, that's a great point. Sal. So. Oh, and you're muted. Forgot to lower my hand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, one of the things about uh, residential issues that uh, that someone mentioned to me last night, uh, Lidge Slagel from Waterbury, is that uh, there were something like 485 FEMA claims from residential property owners, and FEMA may be looking for some coordinated effort from the city to... Uh, to pursue to get as much as uh, as we can for those people. So I'll just flag that, Bill, and maybe you and I can talk about it at our meeting next week to, to make sure that we're doing everything that needs to do, be done to, to do that. Thank you. I just want to mention one more thing about follow-up. Oh, I'll wait for Carrie. Yeah, go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on, on what you said about um, FEMA individual assistance. And I don't know what you're referring to, but I'm hoping that you'll connect and figure that out. But that there are a lot of people in Montpelier who are who are not actually being helped by FEMA. Like it, it, the individual assistance is um, not sufficient to cover a lot of people's needs. Uh, it may help. It may cover the cost of replacing a furnace, but it's not going to cover the cost of bringing the furnace out of the basement onto the first floor, which is what people are all needing to do. And then there are also a number of people, lower income people in Montpelier who may have received FEMA in, uh, assistance during Irene. And that was, con the future FEMA assistance was conditional on maintaining flood insurance. Flood insurance is pretty expensive. And so if you have the option to get flood insurance and you're low income, you might not be able to afford it and you might not get it. And so with, I know for, for with certainty that there are people in Montpelier who got FEMA assistance during Irene, didn't maintain flood insurance, have much more damage now and are not eligible for FEMA assistance. They have no flood insurance and they have no FEMA assistance. And so there isn't, there's nothing left. And there may be other sources that come in the future, but I just think it's important to keep that in the public awareness and to make sure that we are all, that we all know about that. Um, two things I'd like to mention, one, they're not really related. So to this point, um, I think it was last Friday, uh, Kelly and I met with folks at the FEMA Disaster Recovery Center, and it was great to see, you know, if, if you need to go there, they've got everything all their agencies now are set up in one place at Vermont College. So it's a one-stop shopping to walk in. So that part is good. Uh, while we were there, we were talking to them and they were describing uh, their services. And I asked that question. I said, you know, if people have a, a damaged furnace and they now need to raise it. So first, damaged furnace. Yes, we cover, of course, you know, that's, that's part of their flood damage. And I said, okay, well, if they have to raise it, due to um, a regulation, not just because they want to, but the city's saying you have to. Um, and so they said, well, wait a minute. So they got, you know, two other people from different desks. But, you know, explain this again. So I went through the whole thing and, and I'm not making this up. I, I went through the whole thing and I said, so here's the question, blah, blah, blah. And there were three people in front of me and at the same time, one said yes, one said no, one said maybe. <laughs> That, that this could be covered. And I just said, here's the thing, folks. Everyone who comes in your door is going to ask you that question. So you need to have your answer for this one way or the other. 
you know, I don't, I mean, I hope that it's, we'll cover it, but whatever it is, you need to have your answer and you need, and so then Kelly asked, well, can people get reimbursed if they make their repairs now, can they get money? Do they have to wait? And again, it was, well, maybe depending, blah, blah, blah. And again, we said, look, it's, this is Vermont. It might be a gorgeous day, which it was that day in August, but in six weeks, people are going to be needing their furnace. So this is not a, we can take two months to process all of this. This is important and people are going to need this. So they heard it. I don't know what they've come up with, but that was, that was a somewhat, uh, I, I understand where you're coming from, Carrie, because we were left, you know, we walked out of there like, Ooh, that was, that wasn't good. And so, you know, again, we get left in and people say, well, what's FEMA doing? Go to the disaster recovery center and find out because I'm not, I can't, I got yes, no, maybe. Yeah, Carrie. Yeah. Oh, I am so frustrated on your behalf and all of the rest of our behalfs about that. So well, I'm more frustrated for the building owners, honestly. Well, yeah. well, I mean, so so I'm I'm personally in this position of we have no heat in our house right now. And it's it was really cold this morning when I woke up. It was like 52 degrees. And um and we don't know what we're gonna do yet. We we can't figure it out. Um, so I guess I just want to, I think there's a, there's FEMA's going to do what they're going to do. And maybe we can provide input and say, you should actually figure out if, if you know the answer to this question, you should try to answer it. And then I also just want to encourage you, I don't know what the city can do, but if there is anything that the city can do to help provide financial assistance for people to be able to move their utilities out of their basements it's not just fix our utilities we you know because maybe fema and flood insurance can cover the cost of of replacing or fixing the utilities but neither one of those are going to cover the cost of bringing them up to the first floor above the design flood elevation so i i know you don't have an answer for this right now but no, i want an idea though yeah but i want us to put it on the list of things that we need to figure out if we're going to require people in Montpelier to move their utilities out of their basement, we have to think about the financial impact on them. We have to think about ways that we can support that financially because most people, most homeowners, most renters, most businesses, that's not an expense that they can just take on. And so I'm not saying it's the city's responsibility to take on that expense, but we should think about if we're going to make that requirement, we should think about how we can support people financially to be able to do it. Yep. Um, yeah, Sal. Um, maybe someone in the city has better information than I do, but my guess is that the, the cost of doing that, like moving an electric panel up and a furnace up is going to be between six and ten thousand dollars anyway, uh, maybe more, depending on a lot of things. So it's it's not chump change, but it's yeah. So <laughs> Carrie's pointing up, yeah. I haven't you know I haven't priced. I I, I know what it, what it takes to move a panel. Um, so it's it's a bunch of money, um, and I, I agree. If there's whatever we can do, uh, it's going to be a huge help. To uh, I mean, it makes it certainly makes sense to do it because the next time um, it would be less less work to do. But we, you know, anything we can do to help people afford it. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I I think we've mentioned it before, but it's getting more details. Um, there's they just announced like Efficiency Vermont. It's now thirty six million dollars to help homeowner homeowners, renters, and businesses. It, it looks like it's most, it's grants, which is great. So you're not taking on a loan or something, um, but it's like mostly replacing equipment, but it does have money for electric panel upgrades um, and a whole range of things. And so, you know, at a minimum, if the city, however, we're communicating with people is like promoting that and letting people know it's not available until starting September 5th. Um, but if people know it's coming, it looks like they're trying to figure out how they could do even like reimbursements if people are locking stuff in. Um, but just we, like, we definitely want to be letting people 
know that that's available. And I mean, maybe there's some partnership the city could do, you know, Peter Walk, um, wonderful Montpelier resident is the head of Efficiency Vermont. Maybe there's something um, we could brainstorm about, you know, how the city can partner on that or promote it in some way um, to just make it as affordable and feasible for everyone as possible to, to do these, um, uh, these installations. That's, that's a great idea. Do, do you know if that would cover, um, you know, oil furnace relocations or would that require, you know, changing fuel sources? It's things that are um, efficiency Vermont. So it, it is, it does include like energy star rated. I'm just looking at a news article, <laughs> energy star rated boilers and furnaces, but also like pellet stoves, um, heat pumps. So it's a whole, it's a range of technologies and it's basically, you know, you'd be looking at like things that are efficiency Vermont eligible. So you would be improving your efficiency probably, um, which over time should lower your heating costs um, if you're upgrading, but but it's, it's a range of um, technologies. It's not just like specific types of heating sources. It looks like it's pretty broadly defined. And some of those are grants, some of those are 0% loans. So we- Yeah, and it's a bunch of different to, appliances and stuff, yeah. We can talk to Peter and get more clarification from that I'm, on that, I'm sure. Um, trying to think about exactly where we are in this conversation. Well, we're, we're sort of, we've rolled into the sort of flood hazard mitigation, moving things up. Um, yeah. I wanted to say one thing, I see Mike's on, so I wanna let him get into that. Um, but just hopefully to just wrap up the communication piece and I, we got a lot of good suggestions. But I just wanna make sure that we say this publicly because I think it has been lost. Uh, number one, we have, if you haven't been to the, our city's website, we now have this called, uh, you know, this portal, the communications portal, the New Zen City. If you go in there, it's got four projects right now. One of them is the flood. And you click on the flood thing, it's got, you can see every communication that the city sent out related to the flood. So if there's any question about what the city did communicate and when they communicated, uh, it's all there. And it starts on June, July 9, which was the Sunday. The flood didn't happen until Monday night. It starts with information going out on Sunday, alerting people about uh, the danger. And then, so, so there are 22 communications before we actually ex had flooding. Uh, so when people talk about the city didn't get out advance information, that's just factually wrong. Now we can figure out better ways to make sure people are getting it, but these went out to, many of them went out to Vermont Alert, many of them went out through our normal channels, uh, but people could see every bit of communication that went out. So I just want to say that uh, before we went off of that, that, it, that it's all available to look at, and there were a fair amount of communications pre-flood. Uh, I know we've heard from people that the city never said anything, and that's just really not true. So, uh, Bill, Bill, before we get to Mike, for one thing, I think see Lolita's hand up and I want to call on her, but I also want to wrap up because we we started this conversation by talking about the uh, the community forums and where things are going with those. I thought they were very good. It was very good to see such a large turnout. Um, there's another one coming up. And last night, uh, as we were informally debriefing, I talked to Paul Costello, who's managing this uh, this process for us about having Paul and me and you and uh, and probably Katie sit down probably sometime next week to talk about what how we're how we're going from here and uh, and so people can know that we're we're going to be the city government is going to be actively engaging with this uh, community forum process to uh, keep. Move things moving and seeing everything we can do in a constructive way. Uh, and and I I just ran into a neighbor of mine uh, this evening on my way home, and uh, he was wondering if uh, if we'd be providing childcare. I think we had childcare for the first one. I don't think there was childcare for last night, uh, but it is something we should look into because that's an impediment to some people getting out uh, 
to events in person and particularly because the next one is gonna be after school starts. And so families with kids are, are busy. And if we can get childcare, that would be helpful. Um, Lalitha. Hi, hi, uh, good evening. Uh, I just have a quick question. Um, what services are in place in Montpelier for communicating to non-English speaking or reading people in our community? I did it up uh, with a couple of Nepalese family a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when this flood happened, they had no idea what to do because they don't speak English. They don't understand Nepalese. Uh, I'm sure there's some other community who has a problem. So I'm wondering uh, what is in, uh, we have in this. Um, yeah. so that's a great question, Lolita, and um, it's definitely not our strongest area. We, you know, most of our direct communication all goes out in English. I will say that um, this new platform, and maybe Evelyn can help me out here, the new platform Zen City that we have on the website can translate into 59 languages or something like that. 27. 27. All right, I exaggerated. 27 languages. So, uh, and if we know for sure that there are some in particular that uh, we use, but it, you're right, the emergency, uh, that is something that we've been talking about how we can get those out um, more efficiently. And, you know, even having a sense of what languages are spoken in the community would be helpful. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, that's gonna be something that's just gonna be gonna increase over the years, hopefully as we become more diverse. Uh, Karen. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I think this is this is one of those things that municipalities, um, it's it's a little too much to ask individual municipalities to be able to handle all of this. And so fortunately, we have at the state level, we have an office of racial equity. And this was one of the questions that I asked to that office at the beginning of this was um, and so I, I got an answer that there are there's a series of videos in various languages to help people with um, kind of preparation for a flood. It didn't seem totally um, sufficient. It wasn't really good enough. Um, but I think this is the, one of the things that we can add to our list that we need to say to the state that the entire state has... Uh, lots of non-English speakers in it. And none of the individual municipalities are gonna have the resources to be able to provide translation services and to provide uh, proactively uh, addressing and anticipating the needs of non-English speakers. But the state might may be able to do that. And the state is actually working on that really hard. And so I just wanna add this to the list of things that we need to tell the state that we're gonna to need to have information provided in various languages. We're gonna to need to have translation services available. We need to have interpretation services available and we need to have um, a, a number to call or a place to go when we have something pop up unexpectedly so that we can get that information so we can get the translation so we can get things in different languages and provide it to those non-English speakers um, in Montpelier. And we need to get it out to people before the crisis happens, mm -hmm. right? Why you're greedy? You better come. Come on. Okay. Um, so I think Mike popped on when we were talking about um, the the furnaces moving and possible financial assistance and things like that. Mike, did, was that just by accident that you popped on, or were you ready to to make a go of it here? He's still here. Yeah, I didn't know if, if this was going to lead to questions. I just wanted to let you know I was here. It wasn't just my my okay. uh, my name. Um, but yeah, we have been working. Um, there was a lot of comments, a lot of stuff. If there's anything I missed, just, you know, ask ask me whatever questions you want to. Um, so uh, I'm Mike Miller, planning director for the city. And uh, so my office is responsible for all the permitting and uh, the inspections that happen, so the zoning, the river hazard regulations, the building inspectors uh, in my office, as well as uh, 
Josh Jerome does the community development. So that is the grant side of things. So Josh and I have been primarily focusing on exploring those grant sides of things. And it has been as equally, well, maybe not as equally challenging as the residents have had with FEMA, but it's been very challenging for us as well. We have been, um, you know, the rules were put in effect in 2018 for elevating utilities. And it was really done for um, one big reason, and that is uh, under the old zoning and under most zoning in the country, uh, a historic building is completely exempt from having to meet any of the flood requirements. So what happens is over time, they flood, they get put back, they flood, they get put back, they flood, they get put back. Um, and that, so when, when the NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, was created in 1968, the expectation was that over time, buildings would keep getting improved, insurance rates would drop because buildings would become compliant. Uh, the issue is that there's one group of buildings that became compliant because they've been destroyed, and another group of ones that have been um, continued to get fixed. And so now insurance rates are going up rapidly. Anyone who has flood insurance knows they've been going up tremendously over the past 10 years because the National Flood Insurance Insurance Program is insolvent and they need more money. So they raise that for premium. So this is going to continue to be an issue. And one thing um, we wanted to focus on when we made recommendations in 2018, now this was a huge zoning update, so not everything got talked about in detail, but the main point of the change in 2018 about utilities was to address safety. Um, uh, and Bob mentioned this morning in our meeting that uh, after the 1992 flood, there were two fires that were the result of um, water into electrical systems. And then afterwards, they resulted in structure fires. Um, so we really don't, water and electricity don't mix. Um, we had uh, a number of issues where people could either have potentially been electrocuted or there've been you know, issues in other parts of the country you go down into your basement and you've got an electrical panel that's submerged. Um, so really that's, that is number one, primarily a, a health and safety concern. We understand it's gonna cost money, but that one had to go up. And then the other second piece is the furnaces. And that really comes down to our, our three, uh, two of our three biggest floods happened in November and March. And we've had close calls with other ice jams. Um, an ice jam in the winter is really you know gonna, flood a lot of furnaces. And so the goal was to move them out. So since 2018, we have had a number of people come in for permits to replace furnaces and they were required to elevate them and they moved them to their first floor or they put in heat pumps and they put them on the exterior of their buildings. All of the ele elevated utilities, um, we did not have anyone who had an elevated utility that got them damaged in this flood. Um, there were some people who elevated their utilities in 1992, even though they didn't have to, and they came back and told us how thankful they were the fact that they still had electricity and didn't have any issues. Um, so it, it really is a health and safety, and it was it's uh, um, it's it's a good policy objective for us to have, understanding that there is going to be a cost associated with that. And that's kind of a separate piece. So I look at it as, you know, what do we want to do and then figure out how we're going to get there. And, you know, as, you know, in the non-flood times, people come in, they get permits, they figure it out, and they build it into their project that they're already working on. These major floods present a unique situation because we now have, um, we, there are 375 buildings in our flood hazard area. Not every one of them had basement flooding, but probably 350 of them did. Um, so that's a lot of things in the basement that got flooded. And so there's gonna be a lot of demand to try to move these things up. We've already said the requirement to complete this is December of next year. So we know there's gonna take time for people to get there. We're gonna uh, work with people. We are also, Josh and I, looking for money. And when we went to Vermont Emergency Management and tried to talk to them about the grant programs. Um, some of the funding mechanisms um, don't work. Um, for example, if we want to get 
FEMA funds to help raise the utilities, we can do that. But you can't fix only part of a building. So if we give you money to elevate your utility, you also must elevate your house and fill in your basement. And that's the rule. They won't partially fix your house. You either go all the way or you don't. Now, your insurance money will tell you the exact opposite. But the HMGP money and the FMA money and these other sources that we're looking at are telling us, you know, so your insurance says, we'll, we'll give you the money to put it back. And we say, okay, well, we want money to help them elevate it. Well, we can give you money to elevate it, but you'll also have to elevate everything else and fill in the basement. So obviously that source of funding doesn't work. So we are continuing in our office to make phone calls, make these connections, to try to go and get uh, different sources of funding. Um, we're trying to look at perhaps, oh, <laughs> our <laughs> lovely timers on our lights, uh, our US, uh, maybe USDA or some of those types of fundings, those would be more loans. Um, but we have in the past, the city has done a number of grant programs in the past. It works well for smaller amounts of money to loan money at a 0%. Um, so let's say, I don't, I don't know what your costs were, Carrie, but maybe it's uh, fifteen or $20,000. We loan you fifteen or twenty thousand dollars at zero percent. We put it as a mortgage on your property. You don't have to pay us. We don't have to track it as the city as a monthly payment. When you sell your house, we get that money back. Um, it's it's one way that we do a lot of our housing programs uh, in that way to help uh, homeowners. We used to have um, a home preservation housing preservation grant program that worked in that way. I can't afford to fix my roof. Great, we'll give you ten grand replace your roof, we'll put a mortgage on your property, pay us when you sell your house. We used to have a program that did that. Um, so we could come up with a program like that. Again, does, it doesn't force people, but for people who can't afford it, it's an option for a way that the, it goes on as a mortgage. But we're still looking at all possibilities to see if we can get funding, but it has been hard. Um, and it's, um, I guess I'll leave it at that when we get to the, to the, buyouts and the substantial damage homes, I'll, I'll also have an, another set of examples that kind of go into the same same bucket of things of municipalities talking to FEMA and what they can help us with. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and take more questions on the elevation of utilities. So Carrie, why don't you go? Because I think your question sure. might be relevant. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate all that. That is really helpful to hear that update. I think that um, this is the kind of information that would be great for all of us who are dealing with this right now to be hearing, not through this particular venue, because no, you know very few people are listening to this right now. But individual communication, a letter sent to all of us who live in these zones saying, here's what we're working on. Um, here are some of the possibilities. We don't know about them yet. But I mean, we're you know, I, my family is in a position where we, we, we're we not, we, we have resources compared to a lot of people, and yet we are still completely overwhelmed and don't know how we're going to manage all this. People who have less than we do literally can't even think about it. And so to know that, oh, there's a possibility for a funding source maybe coming down the road, or there's this that you might be able to apply for would be so, so helpful to know about that. And, and then to go back to something we were talking about before, where we're talking about kind of what happens next time to have all the information available next time. So to make sure that people aren't taken by surprise, that these are the requirements that they're gonna be facing, to make sure that people know that. So the, so the funding sources that you're exploring now, once you have those set up to make sure that there's, you know, um, a list of those things and that people can know and that it's on the website. So I can just go on the Montpelier website and I can see what resources are available to me as someone who lives right, right. in a high flood risk part of Montpelier. And I'm not really interested in having my house bought out by the federal government and demolished because that would mean I have to leave Montpelier and I don't want to do that. So what are my other options? It would be great to be able to have information like that on the website. So I'm just saying Add that to your list of things to put there in the future and to proactively communicate to people. Even if you don't have all the answers, put it in a letter and send it out to people or put it in an email or put it on front porch forum so that we know these are the kinds of things that are being explored. 
Thanks, Gary. Uh, Tim. Mike, also a question. We've talked about single home programs. Do you know of any that are available for people that have multifamily properties or commercial properties? Yeah, we're looking, we're looking at the whole, the whole gambit because we know um, the, the one, and, and, I, and I did send to Bill, and I think he sent out um, a little bit of what I see as the, a little bit of the plan for where I think we should try to go for, as the city for resiliency. And a lot of the downtown ones are um, the block style buildings, the commercial ones that are downtown. That downtown. Those are really going to need to be flood roofed, most likely. We did get some positive news from um, Vermont Emergency Management they're willing to, they're going to do the grant application for us for what's called a scoping study. Uh, and that's going to look at each individual building. If we get funded, each individual building would get uh, an assessment that would go through and say, okay, what, you know, what do we have to do to, um, you know, city hall, you know, what do we have to do to yeah. uh, where Obishan's is? What do we have to do? Yep. Yeah, Heaney Block. Yeah, whatever. Whatever it is, they would go building by building and do an evaluation that would say, here are the flood proofing things that would need to happen. Because, you know, obviously you look across the street from City Hall, you can't jack up all those connected block buildings. That's just not realistic. So we're going to have to look at things like floodgates and other other ways of seeing how does the water get in and how can we prevent it from getting in. Um, and the example I used for anyone who, who isn't aware, the best example that we have of floodgates is uh, the old Chittenden Bank building, now the M&T Bank that's over on State Street. Uh, that building, if you look carefully at the front and the back door, you will see the floodgate channels. And when it floods, when there's a prediction of flooding, they come in, they drop the gates in, and they lock them down. And no water got in. There was only a little bit of water. They just had to dry out the carpets right next to the doors where a little bit of water seeped in. And they were ready to go, ready to open. So these floodgates, there are these technologies that work, um, but we have to individually, they have to be individually tailored for each building because a wood frame building and a, and a brick building are going to react differently to those flood floodwaters. So um, that's that doesn't give you an answer right now, but at least we have somebody who's looking, who would be looking at flood proofing. Um, but that doesn't that, that doesn't answer necessarily the question of what do we do about the furnaces. We'll be trying to hook on to district heat. We have said in the office December of next year, we recognize in certain instances we're going to be pushing that forward. Now FEMA has told us we're only allowed to give six month temporary wait, you know, permits. You, you you can't let them go more than six months. We just said that's just not realistic. Um, so it's got to be at least a year, and we'll put it to December of next year. If we get to December of next year, and you know, as as long as we're all making, you know, positive effort to continue to to make resolution to the problem, then that's what we'll do. Uh, you know, we'll we'll put another extension on it, and you know, my staff will, you know, take the um, whatever abuse for for giving that waiver on that. Now it isn't a requirement of the NFIP, so they can only beat us up so much. Uh, it is a city requirement to move it up, but um, we do um, we do take it seriously. We do wanna go and get these all these up because we do wanna have eventually at some point that when these floods happen, we aren't getting these things flooded because they're not there anymore. Um, and that's that's kind of the goal. Mike, what does a person do um, so, you know, it's good if we can get extensions, but does someone have to pay to sort of get their thing working now and then, then move it? It's all, so it's the best thing you can do is if you have any questions, email Audra Brown, a Brown at Montpelier VT.org. She can give you all of the answers because some, in some cases we, we have conversations with people who are like, I can't believe I've got to move it up. I just want to fix it. It's like, well, if it can be fixed, it can be fixed in place. If it needs to be replaced, it must be moved upstairs. So there's, a, you know, there are a lot of subtle differences. And the best thing on any project, I don't care if you if you're thinking about building a deck or if you're looking at 
replacing your windows. Um, you know, if you call us or email us, we will give you a free reply that'll say, yep, you need a permit or no, you don't. And we, we'd much rather see people email us with questions like that of, do I, do I need to get a permit? How would this work? Can I get an extension? Um, then we would say, yeah, we would, you know, we would work with you. And in some cases it might be, I, I would need to do X amount of work in order to make this work on the second floor. Maybe we put a, a new gas boiler in the basement that's eventually going to get moved to the first floor because the big oil furnace won't work anymore. But we're going to switch over to an LP because it's smaller. We can't move it to the first floor yet, but we'll work on that next year. Great. Uh, we'll, we're here to go and work out how this is going to happen uh, timing wise. It's just a matter of emailing Audra and she will get you back in writing. And the big thing about emailing is we get lots and lots and lots and lots of requests. And so we're never going to remember every single person's situation. So when we get emails, we get a record of it and you get a record of it. So you have something to refer back to afterwards. And that's why we really prefer people to email because it helps us to be able to get information out and you can review it. And if you've got another question, it comes back to us. We can re-review what we, what we wrote you earlier to go through and say, oh, that's right. This is the, this is that situation that we had to resolve. So email's the best ask any questions. That's why, that's why we're here. We don't charge anything to answer any questions. So it's free. I can ask you this offline, but do you have any sense of, of how many homes are actually have to replace furnaces? I don't have that number yet. We we've been trying to work on, on getting more of that information, more of the numbers, more of the stuff, because we need to apply for grants. That's our thing. We want to be able to apply for grants. We need the information. We sent out a couple of requests and we didn't get much back on what people were charging for stuff uh, or, or the costs, because we need to know how many people were, were damaged and what is the average cost to move up a furnace. And then you multiply those two numbers and you get how much money we would need to apply for, for a grant. So we need, we do need that number. And if people have it, that's great. We have estimates of how many people got their basements flooded, but we don't know definitively how many of those could be repaired, how many of them could be replaced because somebody's basement may flood because they didn't have a backflow preventer on their sewer. So their basement flooded, but their neighbors didn't. So I can't make an assumption because you know, Carrie's basement flooded, that meant her neighbor's basement flooded. Uh, it may not necessarily be the case in, in some instances. Um, in some cases, we can know pretty clearly. Everybody on Elm Street from spring down, they got water into their first floors. So they got completely flooded. So we can make certain assumptions, but we can't um, in other places. And Carrie? Yeah. Um... It's a lot of people and it's not that many people. Um, I think you could you could start making them phone calls. You could start going door to door. Uh, one of the things in the, the group that I was part of in the meeting last night, we were talking about financing and, and the need to get a good understanding of what the damage actually is. And um, I think we know which neighborhoods were affected, I think. Um, I, I have seen some of the sort of the calls to let us know what kind of damage you sustained. And I, and it, that's not a, a lot of people aren't going to respond to that. But if you were to simply ask a lot of people, did you lose your furnace? They will tell you yes or no. And I, I don't think it should be that hard to find out if that's something that you, that you need in order to apply for grant money. The other thing is to let people no, those of us who are right now having people come to our house to give us estimates on how much it's going to cost to get our furnace replaced, it would be great to know that there might be some source of funding for that. And so it's all part of the same communication task. And um, so I, I guess I just encourage you to, to not just sort of put out there, tell us what kind of damage you sustained but to actually go and, and ask people. I mean, we know the neighborhoods where, where flooding happened. I can tell you. I mean, if you want me to, to canvas the people on St. Paul Street, I, I can do that. Um, and maybe there are other city councilors or other city staff that can do similar kind of work. It's 
it's not that mysterious. And I think it's really important to understand. I bet we would all go door to door. That's all the members of the council would go door to door if that's what it took. It's just with a with a survey instrument to say. Yeah. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, I don't at all. This is a really important discussion. I did just get a note from a May who is our next agenda um, item that she can only be on for 10 more minutes. So I just wanted to note if I know that we're just we're having this discussion, if we were gonna move on to another topic in a minute, maybe we could put that on pause and come back to it. Um, so we could hear from a May briefly when it's when it's the right moment, but uh, just wanted to let folks know she's just got 10 more minutes as the kind of one of the lead organizers of that event that we're gonna have to make a decision about tonight, so. Okay, why don't, this might be a good time to suspend this discussion and come back to it. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Um, we have, under we have uh our next item is other business and uh, and the only other business that i'm aware of that we need to talk about tonight is uh, a proposal to do a benefit concert up at uh, the country club road property and bill do you want to kick it off or start right with them eh? um well i can just give you um the, the big broad overview obviously we had this event everyone uh the, the flood event we would love to provide support in whatever way is possible and ama and her group are trying to come up with a benefit concert to raise funds for uh flood relief and as the conversation we're having indicates those floods are definitely needed so i think people want a successful event the event is proposed to be at the elks club which of course we've never held that sort of event there and so uh as city officials, we want every, and I believe the event organizers, everyone wants a successful event. And we're trying to work through this at a pretty short time frame. Uh, and I think initially we were hearing reports of a larger event. And, I, and so um, anyway, I'll let her explain her event. Uh, you've received, I think, copies of the correspondence, so you know some of the issues at hand. And we're looking for some direction. Again, we don't even really have a permit process for the use of this property because it's new to us and I think it's really just us granting permission uh, for it to be used under whatever conditions so I think I outlined I mean obviously you can approve it you can deny it you can approve you can say get it all worked out and come back to us you can say we'll approve it conditionally and let the manager sign off if everything's satisfied you can do those are kind of your range of choices uh, but more you should hear from her because it, they've got a great idea well, thank you. Hi, everybody. This is M.A. Green. Hopefully you can hear me OK. I'm actually over in Maine this evening. Um, yeah, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at the uh, proposal that was sent a few weeks ago that really breaks down who all is involved. What we're proposing is um, Saturday, September 9th at the Old Elks Club. Um, we're looking at event hours of uh, three to seven. Um, there's this is a massive collaboration really between the state of Vermont, um, my production company, another production company, Montpelier Alive, Berry Partnership, and Berry Development um, to raise money to uh, you know give to the Montpelier Strong Fund and also the Berry Community Relief Fund. Uh, so the focus would really be for those two funds. Um, so it's a really nice collaboration. Um, it's been, as I said, a few weeks in the making. We do have a, a final bill of musicians who everyone everyone involved is, is donating their time um, to, to try to put this together. So um, the bill would be uh, Gua Gua, the Ray Vega Quintet, um, uh, Dwight and Nicole, and then Dave Keller. Um, we're looking at an MC. Um, the proposal breaks out the details around the fundraiser, um, it, it will be ticketed, you know, uh, should this be approved, uh, we've, we've got a, a ticketing platform lined up through seven days to sell tickets. Um, and uh, we are, as of today, actually, as of yesterday, Katie and I decided that we would not um, be inviting or having any alcohol vendors on site, um, which takes, uh, it turns it into a completely different component. Um, certainly makes it a lot easier in, in lots of different ways, um, as I'm sure you all know. So we will not be inviting alcohol vendors on site, but we are expecting to have uh, two to four food vendors there. Um, we will be contracting with uh, Green Mountain Concert Services to provide us with security detail. 
and also assist with um, checking people in, you know, scanning their tickets and um, making sure they've paid. Um, Portalettes, that's also another contracted services. And then certainly last but not least is the sound and stage, um, which will be contracted by Magnum PA. Um, what we have talked through over the past couple of weeks via email leading up to this meeting is uh, ensuring that all emergency services needed are there and on site. And so I think I think the biggest, uh, the way I see it, sort of the biggest ask is, you know, what possible from the Montpelier uh, Police Department, of course, and, and from the fire uh, to have presence on site for that. Um, feedback we received was uh, it may be wise to actually contact uh, Washington County Sheriff uh, to help assist with traffic uh, off of Route 2 up to the uh, site itself, as, as, as I'm sure you all know where the site is. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a two-way road, um, but we want to make sure that traffic is, is coming off cleanly and going back on cleanly. Um, we will have a pool, a large uh, army of volunteers helping with parking. Um, our intent with parking is to use the, the lots that are allowed. Uh, and then if there's any overflow needed, depending on the number of tickets we sell, uh, our proposal would be to um, park up off of any area where uh, the schools or the rec department are using the fields. Um, I think at this date, you know, we're looking at, at, at August 23rd now, um, you know, so we're, you know, basically a little over two weeks out here. Um, so, you know, should, should we go on sale with tickets sometime later this week? I, I don't expect, it'd be wonderful if we got uh, ticket sales over 500, but I don't expect we're going to have more than 500 people in attendance at this late date. Um, with it. Um, and um, let's see, what else, what else have I not covered? We are staging for a, a, a another on-site meeting this Friday at two. Um, and certainly I think a great way to kind of hammer through, you know, the, 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 the proposal here online via Zoom and things via email and whatnot would be to, to finalize it in person. Um, that was our intent anyway, in terms of finalizing the actual event site map, which would really, you know, provide a visual for everybody as to, you know, where the stage is going to be, where the parking is going to be, where the food vendors are going to be, the in, the out, um, you know, where, you know, emergency services would be, would be parked or stationed, um, that kind of thing. So um, I'm just trying to see here, I'm just scanning this quickly to see if there's anything I've missed. I just wanted to make sure I was re reviewing everything. I think one last piece, which is in the proposal as well, is that uh, the, the gentleman doing the sound on the stage will be bringing in the generator. So we will not be obviously pulling any electricity from, from the old building there, but uh, all the power would be coming uh, from his generator. So we've secured that. And um, um, I guess that, that, would be, that would be my proposal. In a nutshell, hopefully I've covered everything, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm completely open to whatever questions, concerns, um, and uh, appreciate appreciate the opportunity to present this to you. Thanks, Ame. I I think I would love to see this happen, and I I want to make sure we get everything addressed so that we can make it happen. Nat, I see you. I want to start with members of the council, but I'm not uh, ignoring you, uh, Gary. Thank you. Um, this sounds like a great event. Um, I really appreciate you pulling together something that's going to benefit the community and it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One is when I look at who the beneficiaries are of this, it looks like it's um, it's really businesses who are the beneficiaries. And I am I'm, I'm going to keep beating the drum for the uh, the homeowners and the renters and the, the residents of Montpelier. Um, who are, uh, I think there's a common misperception that FEMA has all of us covered and it really does not. So I'm wondering if there's um, if there's any thought to benefiting just individual people, not businesses. And well, then, I, uh, and certainly, then just, let me just give you my second question then you can answer both of them and I'll shut up. My second question is, I see reference to this being the governor's benefit for, the flood relief, and I want to know what role the governor has in this. Sure. So, or is that I'll something answer. different? Okay. No, no. Thank you. I, I actually meant to cover that. I, I believe it's mentioned in the proposal. Uh, so I'll start. I'll start with your second question. So, uh, one of the event organizers is Connor Kennedy, um, and uh, he is uh, liaisoning with different members of um, 
the congresswoman's uh, and the senator and the governor's office actually have representatives uh, there speaking throughout the day. So another component of the event is there'll be an MC and in between set breaks, um, he will be um, providing either representatives or either the congresswoman and varying senators themselves coming and potentially even the governor to speak. So to answer that, that question, that's that's that piece. The second, you know, your first question, um, I uh, one of my hats that I wear is uh, I'm the executive director of Barry Area Development. We launched the Barry Community Relief Fund around the same time that you guys were reinvigorating and, and relaunching um, the Strong Fund. I, I don't know the details of the Strong Fund. I can tell you the Barry Community Relief Fund is for residents and businesses. Um, so any monies that go into that fund are granted out to residents and businesses. So I, I don't know what Montpelier wants to, and I can't speak to any of that. I can just address from that, you know, from that hat on my head, if you will, um, you know, the you know, the partnership, the collaboration, when Katie and I first started talking about it, it was just sort of a no brainer, like, like let's help these two communities we work in um, and do this thing that will feel good for the community after all of this and come together. And it just made a ton of sense to do it in our capital. And, um, um, but, you know, when it comes to, other areas you may want to, how you, I, I can't speak to that piece. I can only address the, the Barry Community Relief Fund piece. Thanks. Any question, other questions or comments from members of the council at this point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's jump right to you. Much, <clears throat> how much will you be charging for tickets and, um, What's your contingency plan in case of raid? Ned, can you uh, identify yourself before we? Nat <clears throat> uh, Winthrop, Montpelier resident. Oh, great questions. Um, so the ticket sales will be 35 for adults and 12 for children 12 and under. Um, and the stage is covered by a tent and um, we're securing a large tent um, to put actually in front of the stage. Um, so that if it does rain, uh, there'll be places for people to stand. Um, so that's that's also a part of the the uh, the event. Thanks. Um, any other questions from members of the council? Or maybe go back to uh, to Bill. Just oh, uh, Chief Gowans. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I, I appreciate your efforts, and I plan. I, I think there's a meeting there too, uh, Friday at two, which Friday I plan at two. to. Yeah, and I, I plan to attend that meeting. But a couple of questions: um, there, Will there be a limit of tickets sold? Will we? Will you limit the amount of people up there? Obviously, we have some big concerns. Um, there's one way in and one way out of that venue. There's one narrow road that gets in and out. So that's one question I have. And I'll give you my second question. I know that there's going to be no vendors selling alcohol. Will there be, um, will your security staff be checking for alcohol coming in? Similar, I know you're, you're, you're from uh, with Barry. Uh, similar to like at Thunder Road, where every bag coming in is checked for alcohol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So great questions. Um, so in terms of the ticket limit, um, I, I guess I, I, I apologize for coming back with a question, but I'm not familiar with Montpelier's, you know, event um, tiers in terms of venue site and how many per, you know, based upon the venue site. But, um, you know, we were initially talking about a much larger crowd up there a few weeks back, um, given um, uh, some potential musicians that could have been on the bill. That changed uh, and also time has passed. Um, and I think realistically doing events for years myself, you know, if we're looking at two weeks out, like I said earlier, if we sell 500 tickets, that'll be wonderful. Um, so hopefully that answers your first question. I, I don't expect there to be more than 500 people coming and going um, from, that, from that one in and, in and out entrance. Um, in terms of the alcohol check, yes. Um, so the, at the entrance, 
uh, Green Mountain Concert Services, one of their contracted jobs will be to, yes, check back. So they have, they'll have their little scanners there. They'll be scanning people's tickets on their phones. Some people have printed out copies and, and you know, there'll be a check of the bag. Um, that, you know, like you would go to any event and, and you see them them there doing that. So hopefully that answers your your second question. Was there a third as well, Chief? No, and uh, I'm sorry. I, I I should have let you know. I was I'm the fire chief, so I, I apologize for that. But I I will be there. I'll, I will I'll be there on Friday at two o'clock. So okay, great. That's fantastic. And I, I don't know is is um is the PD chief is able to join us as well, or is I'm not sure if he's on here or the, the deputy is. Okay, sorry. Uh, Sal. Oh, and I also see Kevin Moulton. Yeah. Can we let Deputy Chief Moulton? Yeah, let's it? get him on. Please, here. please do, yes. So I, I want to echo uh, Chief Gowan's concerns. I'm sorry, uh, Kevin Moulton with the Montpelier Police. Um, the One of the major concerns is the one way in, one way out. Um, I, I don't want to beat that drum too loudly, but uh, if an emergency arises and people are evacuating that area quickly, I'm going to have a hard time sending emergency personnel up. And then my next question would be, um, it sounds like you're asking for all of like Montpelier emergency services, and this is benefiting both Barry and Montpelier. Has Barry been asked to to match what, what Montpelier is bringing to the table? No, but we certainly can. Um, you know, I think um, given where it's, where it's being proposed to be held, um, I, I don't know what your requirements are in terms of uh, number of vehicles, number of emergency vehicles for something like this. Uh, you know, would you, you know, at the road, are you envisioning, you know, one one officer flagging cars in and out? Uh, I mean, I've been up there a bunch of times um, and I, I do completely hear and want to completely validate your concern. I've run events for years and the last thing you want is any kind of emergency situation where cars can't get, you know, when you're trying to send something up and you can't, you can't get in. Um, you know, I think as in any emergency situation, cars would be needing to pull off. That's what people do when there's a, 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 a ambulance or whatnot going through. Um, you know, we're going to have Green Mountain Concert Services. Part of their detail is to be up and down that road as well. And we're going to be mapping this all out on Friday as well. So that they will be there. They cannot... Um, given their uh, insurance or liability, I'm not quite sure what it is, but they can't actually be on the road flagging. They do have a flagging company they work with. Um, and so that is something we could look into, certainly, if you'd like, um, and, uh, you know, have additional um, flagging, uh, additional flagging operation out there at the road. Um, but I, I guess I wasn't imagining, um, but please tell me what, what's best, more than one ambulance on site just to be there um or and one more than one or two you know cruisers uh, but uh, you know if if we want to um have that be a combination of both um you know the the city of montpelier and the city of barry and the town of barry I, i'm i'm happy to make that outreach to, to barry town and city um if that's if that's what's preferred well my my concern is is you know as you can imagine uh, earlier in our discussions it, it, our budgets are are being pretty well scrutinized and it mm -hmm. you know, I, I get that this uh, event is happening in Montpelier but the benefit of this event is going community you know mm -hmm. across community lines mm -hmm. it would be uh, certainly easier for our department to absorb a smaller cost than it would be to to fund additional overtime and and then all all the the proceeds go to other communities as well. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if I think you know, to put it plainly, I think they should have some skin in this game too. Sure. No, I appreciate this feedback, and I think that's a very completely reasonable request. Um, I, I I guess I need you to tell me, you know, with this event as we're describing it, with the number of people we're kind of expecting, you know, would you normally have two cruisers on site? And if that's the case, you know, would we would be would we want one from Barry and one from Montpelier? You know, are, are we wanting more than one ambulance, probably not. Uh, and we were, um, you know, thinking, I don't, do you need to have a fire truck there? Or is it more, they're going to be kind of, you know. Um, yeah, I, I can't speak for the fire department, um, mm -hmm. but, a, but a crowd of, of, of 500, or even if it got to a thousand would overwhelm one officer and one cruiser in, in a hurry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, 
you know, typically when we get it to a large crowd, we call the state police. We have, you know, yep. cards in place for, you know, for a mass incident. So, and, yep. and I don't, I don't know that that's, we've really had the time to flush that out. I don't, I haven't seen a safety plan. So um, this all seems pretty quick. Can I jump in here? And I know we have two council members with their hands up, but I, I wanted to respond to a question you've had a couple of times in May, and that is, this is all un, uncharted territory for us at this site. So, you know, we don't know what to expect there either. We haven't never had an event like that. We've, you know, we're, we, I think, have a good sense of how things work on the state house lawn. We have a good sense for how things work at Vermont College lawn. Even National Life's Do Good Fest, which is huge, uh, you know, it's on their property. They take a lot of responsibility for it. And not that you're not taking responsibility, but, you know, we, we know what we need and we, we plan, you know, for a year in advance to make sure we have the resources. So we're in a little bit in the dark too, as far as the tiers, because this is, you know, it's a site that could hold, the, the land itself could hold a lot of people. The cars, the traffic and stuff can't, but the, the potential for people there without some sort of limit or, you know, is it's tough to predict, you know. So I'm, you're asking us like, what are our expectations? And I think what, what you're hearing from us is not that we don't want this to be successful, is that we really don't know what's happening um, at this site because it's it's brand new. Mm -hmm. No, I completely understand. And, and I think the whole the whole thing is a, is a huge, uh, great example of, of you know, collaboration and teamwork and, and trying to create something for our communities. Um, and I think all these questions are wonderful. Um, I, I am more than happy to, I think if, if I can get a gauge, cause I, I'm not, um, you know, um, back to, back to you chief. I like, I'm not, uh, I'm sorry, officer, I forgot your last name, but I, I don't know, like a crowd of a thousand people, would you normally have, you know, three police officers there, four police officers there? Because we can certainly call the sheriff's office, uh, you know, in Washington County and have this discussion with them. If you would normally bring them in, we're, we're happy to collaborate with that piece. Uh, if you, you know, want Barry involved, absolutely. I can't see why they wouldn't be able to send one or two and absolutely share the cost, share the cost of, you know, that, that overtime, as you said. Um, with another, with, you know, with the other community benefiting from this. So um, I, I would strongly suggest um, whoever can possibly come to this site visit on Friday, be there. Um, some of the, um, some of the stuff really could, I think, be more easily talked through in person on the, on the grounds itself, um, really mapping things out. And our plan was to meet there anyway and finalize what the event map would look like and where everything would be going. Um, yeah. Thanks, um, Chief Gallons. Um, yeah, MA, if you could, um, it would be great if you could send out ahead of time, maybe tomorrow, uh, uh, just a uh, layout map of what you're planning of where um, vendors are gonna be, where the stage is gonna be. So we could take a look at that. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, just mm -hmm. a simple piece of, you know, one, a napkin, yeah, yeah, no, lay we... it out. So, so we can get an idea of what's gonna happen. So we yeah. can start thinking about how we're gonna protect those folks who are coming to the event. who are gonna be sitting on the lawn. So we have an idea where they're at, so we can start thinking about that. Do we need to bring in barricades? What do we need to do to protect folks? So mm -hmm. if you could do that um, ahead of Friday, that would be really sure. a, a really good. I, thank you. I, mm -hmm. um, okay, looking back to council members, uh, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this this kind of the discussion that's happening right now this level of detail and going back and forth with the police department and the fire department, this feels like the kind of thing that city council should not be dealing with. This is not our business. Um, and so I, I am not sure what we're being asked for from here. It seems like you're all are working at your plans in a city council meeting, which I'm not super comfortable with. Uh, we, we need to take kind of the higher level view. So what do you need from city council tonight so if i can i can respond to that carrie um basically they need permission to use the site 
um, because it's the city owns the site. It's not normally a public vendor. Now, now in, in, you know, everyone's got good intentions here. Normally the, there would be a, a much longer lead time and all of this would have been worked out and you would have gotten a request for site and we would have all signed off on it and it would have described how it was all gonna go and you just would have said yes or no. And I think that, the, and we were trying to get there honestly um, before this meeting, we just weren't able to put it all together. So that's where you're at. And I think that's where, I mean, you all have to figure out what you wanna do with that. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, Sal, then Donna. Uh, I had a, a similar concern. I would just add to it that with with just 500 people anticipated, I, I just wonder if it if it makes sense as an event. I mean, if you're talking about 2,000 people, the revenue versus cost uh, makes seems to make sense. I wonder. I, I don't have any numbers in front of me. I, I imagine that would be part of your planning. Um, it strikes me that at 500 people, it uh, it's a lot of effort. Um, I mean, it make it will make people feel good, and we all need that. But I don't know that the revenue side um, is, you know, is uh, promising. Well, we've raised sponsorships to pay for all the contracted services, so uh, every ticket sold will be going to the two funds. Um, so obviously, until we know what the total number of tickets are, I don't know what that dollar figure will be. Um, but certainly, of course, you know, the, you know, these things, as, as we all know, these types of events um, take six months plus to plan properly. Um, so this is, we're coming at it from a different angle and for a different purpose, and I guess maybe a different mission. Uh, thanks, uh, Donna. Well, I think that I would, I would, I am making a motion that the council approved their use of the property as long as our public safety personnel and city manager can sign off on it. And that's where they should just deal with their details. But I would like to have support for the motion to let them advance and see if they can work out all the details. That's why I'm making the motion to approve use of the property. Second. Okay, there's a second. And Lauren, you, by coincidence, you had just had your hand up next. So. <laughs> I did. And I was I was going in the same direction, I think. I mean, I'm so grateful for the team pulling this together. It is short notice because it is a benefit trying to react to a crisis. Um, and I think, you know, normally when there is more time and all of the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, um, then we would be really deferential to our city staff on, you know, is everything going to be safe for the community? Can, you know, are all the logistics worked out? And so I would, I just think that Donna's motion that we're approving use of the land, you know, with Bill giving final approval to um, that all of our kind of safety departments and everything have, uh, have signed off on um, the final plan with the organizers of the event. I, I, I like hearing that one of the things that I like uh, that I think we should be clear on if, if we adopt this resolution or this motion is that, uh, you know, who wants to say, no, we don't, we're not going to approve this positive event that's going to make people happy and is going to uh, raise some thousands of dollars for flood relief. But I think we need to be clear that if the uh, public safety and our city manager do not think it's a safe thing, then as a council, we're fully endorsing their decision because we repose our trust in them month in and month out. And so nobody but us on the council should feel like they're being the heavy if, uh, if we can't get to a plan that can be approved. Is there any other? Oh, Pellin. Yeah, uh, thank you. With um, former events, we used to have more detailed information to approve. So this one, I don't feel comfortable say yes or no, because we don't have all the details. Uh, and during the presentation, and it was mentioned that usually it takes like six months to plan um, this kind of events. 
and we have not that long time. So I will go with the group decision, but I have some concerns that uh, it is a little bit immature, I think, for the council to say yes or no without knowing all the details. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Chief? Yeah, um, I mean, we are going to want definitely on Friday, if not before, a plan for the day of the event, if you know, if we get to a point where we're at, and, and we'll have to decide, and I'll have to speak with the city manager, a certain number of people, and the parking lot is full, and the grass is covered. How are we going to stop people from coming in? Is there, um, you know, I, I could foresee this. You know, you know, we had three hundred people, or three hundred fifty people at the state house last night. How many? You know, we're going to get to a point where this could overwhelm us, overwhelm public safety, overwhelm the parking lot, overwhelm the, the driveway. Um, well, so I'm gonna wanna see a plan from yeah. you to when do we stop people coming into this? I, I think we simply propose a, a ticket cap and and we, you know, all the tickets go on sale online. We put a cap on it. Um, and so that, I think that cap number can probably be decided by Friday with a site visit. Um, certainly with with the police with yourself um, with anyone needing needing to make the safety plan final um, you know you go up there if you decide 500 is uh, I, I think we need to see it and we can cap that certainly and 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 sales and and we're not selling at the door there's no selling at the door so scanning happens lower down and and you know that would be a part of the logistics we'd need to figure out but we can cap that and I completely hear where you're coming from. The last thing I think any of the organizers want is this sprawling thing up the golf course with cars everywhere. We're not envisioning that. Um, and, you know, it's a celebration um, with, um, you know, people at the gubernatorial level talking about the experience and, you know, musicians singing and people eating food and families getting together and let's keep it manageable. Let's absolutely keep it safe. And something that everybody has a wonderful time at, um, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, so I will definitely get you a sketch of the map, and then we can finalize that on Friday, I think. Uh, but I can send you what, what's going to be, you know, just a PDF of, of um, the map uh, later tomorrow. Okay, hey, thank you. Okay, any other discussion before we move to vote on the motion? Uh, Palin. Uh, yeah, one more thing. Why don't we use other places we know very well? Why does it have to be on the country club um, land? Because we know other places, right? So we are sure what we could do. So why are we discussing this specific land? Um, I that was proposed uh, initially several weeks back, um, given the layout and the space. Um, National life is not available. That was already exhausted. Um, and discussions relative to using the state house lawn haven't really come into the picture given the the amount of work happening in that location currently, of course, with 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 the recovery. So um, I, hopefully hopefully that answers your question. But in terms of Montpelier, those were kind of the three areas where it seemed like, okay, we could do this and have people, you know, and park people safely, et cetera. Um, we wanted, and it was almost immediate decision from the very beginning that this should be done in the capital, you know, but to benefit both Barrie and Montpelier. Um, there are certainly places in Barrie. Barrie is not the capital. Um, Montpelier is the capital. So uh, that's sort of, that was the reasoning. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Thanks. Are we ready to vote? If so, all those signify by saying, in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, we'll have a, a roll call. Um, Kate? Yes. Brown? Aye. Alfano? No. Nahini? Tim, you're still here? Yeah, still here. 
Oh, they said yes. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't hear you. I was too soft, sir. Uh, uh, Cone? No. And Hurl? Yes. Okay. So the vote is four to three or four to two, and, and it passes. And thank you for coming to us with this. And I wish you good luck with your uh, with your planning and uh, negotiation or discussions with uh, with city officials on Friday. And before Thank you that, so much for the opportunity to present, and um, um, I look forward to meeting with everybody on Friday. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye now. Bye bye. Can I just say a word, Amy, before you leave? Oh, certainly. Uh, if, if for some reason it doesn't work out, then maybe you can do it at another time. So. Mm -hmm. Just keep that in consideration, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Now, um, we are we are at eight forty. We usually take our break at eight thirty, and so we don't have much left on our agenda. Should we take our a break and then get back to it, or just uh, power through? We can continue. How much are people going to talk through? Sometimes we can be really lengthy at the end of our meeting. Let's take our break. through. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, the question really is the biggest question in my mind is how much more do we have uh, to what to cut cut back to the flood recovery discussion, and if we have more to talk about there, because that's what's going to take up the time. And we're, Mike, we had you uh, talking, and I don't know if we have, if you had anything more that you were planning on covering. Uh, uh, yeah, I did want to comment briefly on, um, there'd been some discussion of the buyouts and some of the work, um, really what I have been focused on for most of the past six weeks. And I did want to just kind of brief the council on that. Great. Um, so I'll try to keep it try to keep it brief. Um, so a lot of the efforts that um, I took while Josh has been doing a lot of the grant research um, was to try to address those most heavily impacted by this flood. So our um, we have one requirement that we have to do as a part of uh, the planning and the permits, and that's to do what is called a substantial determination estimation. And uh, so that's one part of it, and it's related to this. So what we need to do is to look for properties that have been substantially damaged. More than 50% of the building has been damaged as a result of the flood. So it's 50% of the building value. If your building's worth $200,000, did you get more than $100,000 in damage? And so we needed to identify those buildings. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, historic properties are exempt from a number of things, including this. So we were looking for things that didn't qualify as historic. Um, they may be old, but if they're not on the historic register, they're not historic. So we had to look through the properties that were um, had water into their first floor. That's pretty much, if you got water in your basement, you're not substantially damaged. Um, if you got water into your first floor, then you are potentially substantially damaged. So we had to go out and evaluate um, the 375 properties, and that's what we did. We we went through, did a review, eliminated all the historic properties. Then we went to the remaining 100 properties that are not historic, and we had to do an evaluation of each and every one of those buildings. And we narrowed the list down, and we started working with folks. And these were the most heavily damaged folks. Um, so we created a list. Uh, there were maybe 10. 10 or so properties that fit that bill of substantially damaged. Now, what's what's important about substantially damaged is, according to NFIP, according to the way the flood rules work, is a substantially damaged building has two choices. You either must demolish your building or you must elevate the building. So um, I had to meet with a lot of people and have a lot of really hard conversations in people's what's left of people's living rooms to go and tell them these are the two choices that you have as a result of the position that you're in. So it's already really hard. I have no money to offer them. I only have to offer them. These are your choices that you have. 
So a lot of my time has been spent. We've created um, a small listserv, and I've been trying to give them weekly updates. We have um, expanded that list to include what we call significantly damaged buildings. So those are historic buildings that are very close by. So some um, State Street, Lower State Street, after Bailey, before you get to the cemetery, there's a group of about eight buildings. The first one didn't get flooded. The second one got flooding in the basement. The rest of them got flooded. Um, they may not all be sig substantially damaged, but um, many of them were. Uh, one or two of them is are historic. It's, it would, it's not really fair to go and tell them, well, we're not talking to you because you're not substantially damaged. You're significantly damaged. So the historic property has the legal right to simply, other than elevating their furnace and electric panel, they could put everything back and move back. Um, and that's their right. Everybody else doesn't have that right. So we've created listservs. We're doing a lot of outreach. We've started to get estimates um, because we really wanted to as quickly as possible. These, these folks really need to figure out their, uh, many of them are homeless. Um, they're or living a family. They're, they're you know they're, they're paired up working living a family. Most of them have founded places, but we really wanted to help them identify funding for them first. They were my priority to try to find out how we can get them funding so we can get their buildings elevated because all of them had flood insurance, but flood insurance only covers fixing the building. It doesn't cover elevating the building. So they needed, um, and we brought in uh, Messier, and we brought in, um, uh, well, actually, only Messier has shown up to, to, to look at all these properties. He's given estimates for uh, elevating. We met with Vermont Emergency Management. Uh, I met personally with the folks from Waterbury to learn as much as I could about building elevations. Um, Lamoille County Planning Commission, I met with, uh, talked with uh, their sen uh, senior planner as well to try to learn as much as I could because we really needed to find out about elevating buildings because they really have two choices, buyouts or elevating buildings and all of them want to keep their homes. And so my goal was to try to find out how we could get money to help them keep their homes. And the lessons that I learned from all of these places from Waterbury and Lamoille County and from Vermont Emergency Management is FEMA money is really designed to buy out properties. And once FEMA buys out a property, it is perpetually green space. You can't go back later and put new housing on it that's elevated. If FEMA buys it, it's perpetually green space. So, um, and the rules are really stacked against elevating buildings that are historic. And this is where a slight definite difference in definition of historic comes in because under the federal rules, if it's older than 50 years, it's eligible. Um, we don't, in our zoning rules, use eligible. We say, if you're on the historic register, you're historic. If you're not on the historic register, you're not, because we want to have black and white rules. Um, NFIP, FEMA has eligibility. So that means there's all these questions that come in. But once it's an older building, um, so, for example, Waterbury had 10 properties that wanted to be elevated after Irene. Um, in the end, only one building managed to get through the elevation process using federal money. And that one property was not historic. And that's why it got through. The other nine could not get through, some of which were demolished, some of which were simply rebuilt right. and left right where they were. And we do know of at least one of them that reflooded again last month. So right. it's really disappointing. Um, as a result of that, uh, I put a lot of effort, um, you know, working with Bill to go through and reach out to our legislative delegation. Um, federal money is not going to be how we help these folks unless it comes through a um, something, uh, an earmark or something like that. It's going to be extremely difficult. The, the FEMA money would be very difficult to use. Community development block grant money is extremely difficult to use in these situations. So really what we need is the state to step up and help reallocate some funds. Mm -hmm. And the numbers I've been trying to give to our legislative delegation um, at the state is that ballpark numbers is about $200,000 per house to elevate it. Um, might be a little more for some, a little less for others. Um, and we have about 10 buildings. 
So we need between 1.5 and $2 million. And that would help save 18 units of housing. So that's what I'm trying to do, get $2 million to save one, uh, one you know, you know, let's for round numbers call it 1.8 million for 18 units. So it'd be about $100,000 per unit to help these get elevated, to help homeowners keep their houses that they already own. Some of these are quadplex rentals. There's one quadplex rental. There's a duplex in there. Um, there's a house which has an accessory apartment. So there are a number of, a, a mix of units that are in there. It's not just State Street. We also have some on Elm Street that are also um, in, in that same area we have a group of them that are in this category that really need assistance so i've reached out to our delegation they're going to try to um, get special funding for montpelier to help these folks out um, and our hope is to get this money so that way we could be able to get some elevations uh, or some foundations poured the buildings elevated and get some foundations poured then the homeowners can use their insurance checks to fix the buildings. Um, we would only be paying to elevate the building. Uh, we don't know if this is gonna work. I haven't been able to make, you know, I can't make any promises. I don't make any promises because it's, you know, it's it's up to the whim of a lot of other people, but that's where a majority of uh, the effort has been going at this point is to try to make sure we've got, uh, make sure these, these most impacted people have been covered, uh, that they have places to go, uh, it's been really hard because, um, you know, some of them have uh, families with kids uh, going to high school and they're like, you know, this is great. I mean, I can live over there, but, you know, uh, with, you know, my parents or my brother or whatever, but how do I get my kid to keep going to high school, which is a couple of towns away? This This doesn't work for people who have kids going to school in the next couple of weeks. So we've been really trying to work very hard. To, do, to answer as many of their questions, same questions some of you have. Can I fix my house and elevate it later? Um, it, you know, all those types of questions. Those are the questions we've been trying to work through um, with getting some contractors, getting some information and really working uh, to try to get these folks. Uh, and we're, we're trying to expand the list, but most of what we're looking at from an area, if you're trying to understand what area we're looking at, the heaviest hit area in Montpelier was that area in State Street. Um, all the way actually down to almost to the creamy stand toy town. The last few buildings were just had flooding in the basement. The old toy town motel is probably the last of the heavily significantly damaged buildings in that stretch. Um, Elm street from state to spring and main street from, um, Barry to the roundabout. Those are all areas where we had water in the first floor. So those are the areas that we've been trying to, to categorize into two places. Are you significantly damaged? Are you substantially damaged? If you're substantially damaged, then we have to have a really hard conversation. And we've had all of those conversations. We're still reaching out to some of the substantially damaged to try to also find out. In some cases, they might sell their property to somebody else who might say, I'm willing to buy it and fix it. And so we're, we're trying to really work with people to decide where they're at. We can't make the decision for them. If they want to pursue a buyout, they can pursue a buyout. Um, if they want to pursue elevation, they can pursue elevation. If you're substantially damaged, though, you have to pick one or the other. And we're, we're going to try to help homeowners, whichever they pick, we will help them accomplish it. And that's that's where most of my effort has been over the past couple of weeks is really trying to focus on on that on that group to try to get them as settled as we can um and uh you know i certainly understand we we haven't maybe been um putting enough uh effort as well to to the others we 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 put different damage into different buckets and like um business community montpelier alive doing a great job We'll let them take care of that bucket. Um, we we need to take care of the commercial property owners with flooding into the first floor. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, and then we have this group, and then we've got the last group, which is the biggest group, which is a group of people who ha had the flooding in the basements and the other the other damage that is uh, no less, um, you know, which which is no less difficult for them to deal with at their level. But we we've we will 
be continuing to try to get more and more uh, to grow our circle and get more information out. And we probably haven't been doing enough to get to that last group with all the information that uh, that they need to get. We've been relying on Michelle working with the contractors to try to get as much of that information out. But I'll work with um, Evelyn to try to do a better job of rolling out more information to um, about the basements and how to deal with elevating the utilities and all those other pieces. But I did uh, I know Bill wanted me to, to have a conversation or at least mention what we've been doing about those those groups of people, those 10 to 15 hardest hit people. Um, and right now, I think our this last our year. demolition list is relatively small. We're, we're, we've got um, Casella's looking at dem demolishing a building. We have two vacant buildings that were flooded that we're looking to demolish. Um, but we don't have a lot. We don't have, I don't know of any buyouts right now. Um, that are FEMA buyouts. Um, but that may change over time as people learn more about their um, insurance and FEMA benefits decisions. So I'll so, leave it at that. So Mike, you're talking to FEMA and it sounds as though there's a push and pull with FEMA where FEMA really resists uh, the elevation and they're really bi their bias is really in favor of, uh, of the buyout and demolish option. and do you get anywhere with them when you say, well, you know, look, we already have a critical housing shortage in Montpelier, and the last thing we want to do is demolish buildings that are and could be providing homes for people? Yeah, my so I haven't been working directly with FEMA. What I've been working with is Vermont Emergency Management. And working with and talking with everybody else who has worked with FEMA and their experiences of working with FEMA. And Josh has been looking through the the numbers and in the books, and it, te it tends to track with what we've heard from other people, which is that um, by and large, the the system, unless you're not, you know, if you're a historic or eligible for historic, it's extremely difficult to elevate. And it's very hard to find examples of ones that have happened. Um, so, and that was from Vermont emergency management saying that it's just really hard to go and, and get those. It's less from FEMA, but your example of it's of losing and we're in a critical housing shortage. That is the message we are trying to give to the legislative committee. So when I talked about a hundred thousand dollars to save a building, um, and 1.8 million to save 18 units, when the state passes a budget and they go through and look at it they are basically allocating about $400,000 to create one new housing unit. So, um, you know, if you have 20 housing units, that's $8 million. And we're looking at, well, if we rounded up to 20 housing units, we'd be talking about $2 million. So we can save 18 units for $2 million, or we could take $2 million of federal money demolish those buildings, and then spend $8 million of state money to replace those units. And you can just look at it and say, this doesn't make any sense. But the way the state rules are working, um, the Housing and Conservation Board is, is not interested in helping us elevate. That's not what the program is for. They've got a program to build new housing units. Well, I mean, it doesn't make sense. So we reach out to ACCD. They they give us kind of the same thing. This is where we're at. We don't have money that helps you do that. We have money to help you build new units. But I can save four times the number of units for the same amount of money. And so logic only gets you so far. <laughs> but we've we have given this information, and the numbers are you know that the, the, the the dollars and cents just make sense. Uh, and and so I think our legislative delegation gets it and they are um, going to be moving this forward. It does require, you know, a, an act of the legislature to to make a change to the money that was allocated. So either they need to change the rules for the money that was allocated or they need to find new money to give to us to help in this situation. Um, and so that's. Uh, it's in their hands right now to figure out how that's going to play out. Um, that's between the legislature and the governor to sort out which route. And we hope, uh, our hope is that we get something 
that falls in there that gives us the ability to go and work with these, um, as we said, uh, eight, 10 individual buildings to help them get elevated. Uh, but we're not just counting on them. We are exploring other options um, to go and see if maybe uh, a partner like Downstreet, a couple of these buildings are old. Maybe they would be interested in having their building demolished and sold to uh, Downstreet to get, you know, it, it, you know, if we can't get this money, maybe we can get new money by demolishing the building and then building a new building in its place because we have money for new buildings. So, all right, we have to bulldoze the existing building to get money to build the new building. Um, so we would be spending $400,000 to build a new building where the, where the old building was. Um, again, the money doesn't make sense, but at the same time, it could help these folks stay where they are. So we, we continue to look at a lot of different options because we don't, we don't have all the answers yet. And there are a lot of programs out there. Um, and that's, I guess that is about the answer to the question, I guess. Thanks, Mike. I think you've just given me, uh, the line for my tombstone logical <laughs> gets you so far. <laughs> Any other comments or questions from members of the council? No, Donna. It was really great to get that information. It's another one of those things at some point the public needs to know about. So think about how you can condense it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We, I mean, like we said, most of what we're, we've been doing is it's it's been hard because we don't have answers. You don't want to tell half a story and just leave it there. We We keep waiting to get that thing that says, you know, now we know how we can help. So now we can tell the story that says, here's how it started, here was the middle, and here's how it ended. Um, and we just keep hoping we can kind of get that. What's the end going to be? We know it's going to take some time, but let's hope we can find a happy ending to the story. Yeah, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mike. Really helpful to understand what you're doing and really important work. Um, I mean, I'm wondering if our little lobbying committee might want to get together sooner rather than later. I can think of, uh, you know, a handful of ideas to try to push on um, some key legislators for, I mean, this seems like a no-brainer. The e-board could probably approve this. They redirected some money um, to go to flood relief efforts already. Um, so, we won't be able to even make a pitch before the legislature reconvenes. So um, anyway, would have would be happy to strategize and maybe our council lobbying committee could uh, could help you. Great idea. I was just talking to our lobbyist last night and uh, making plans to meet. So yeah. Great. So, um, so it, I don't mean to cut Mike off. Uh, a couple of that, so I just want to go over quickly a couple of things I uh, want to talk just briefly about City Hall, just briefly about FEMA, but it was one thing I want to make sure that is clear for you. This is sort of in the public needs to know thing. I see Kurt is still on. Um, but in the in the flood hours, we've talked a lot about what happened with the hub, what happened with communications, what happened with the police fire moving dispatch. And lost in that story, uh, I think, was uh, what DPW did and the way they protected. Uh, and I, you know, I, I say this because I've known bits and pieces of this. And this morning we were sort of debriefing what went well and what didn't occur in his quiet way, just kind of outlined so, some of the things that had happened. And I was like, people need to know this. Um, so I asked him to put together an outline and I know Kurt is brief. So uh, if you would indulge him, uh, and I'm sure he doesn't even want to do this, but I really think DPW deserves to get recognized because a lot happened in those 24 to 48 hours that uh, saved a lot of property. And I think people should know this. So with that, I'd like to have Kurt talk a little bit. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bill. Um, Kurt Modica, Public Works Director. Um, so yeah, this morning, like Bill said, we were sort of debriefing on uh, flood, uh, flood items and um, just wanted to point out for council and the public uh, the work that our crews did to really sort of protect the infrastructure um, during the flood event. Uh, so uh, just a few examples, um, you know, of, of things that our staff did during the flood is um, uh, Berlin Hill uh, was washing out the culvert at the bottom of Cedar Lane plugged during the flood. And, um, you know, staff brought equipment up there, restored the, the 
the hills really were sort of the focus um, of our staff during the flood event, you know, in the downtown uh, things um, very quickly were getting underwater. And at that point, you know, there's really not much we could do, but on the hilly sections of town um, where water picks up a lot of velocity and becomes uh, erosive, uh, the pavement, like I said, on Berlin Hill is actually starting to unravel. Um, they were able to get up there, uh, open that culvert up and uh, restore uh, drainage. Um, there are similar locations all over town. Hill Street was another example where the drainage systems were, were backing up. Um, they were able to get there and save the pavement. Um, uh, as, a, as a just another note, before the, the event started, um, our street supervisor has a list of locations that, um, that are either um, a system set up to protect from flooding or are prone to um, you know, uh, backing up during flood events. Uh, so one of those is at the top of Taplin Street. The city years ago constructed um, sort of a, a small retention structure up there, made sure that was all clean. That was another area that um, even after the, you know, preemptively cleaning it before the flood, <clears throat> it did still catch debris and we had to open that up again. Um, again, Taplin is one of the steeper streets in town um, to protect that from uh, from getting damaged. Um, so there's a lot of areas like that. Um, uh, you know, the uh, park where the frog pond is um, on, in Hubbard Park. Um, you know, again, uh, a lot of drainage structures up there. The city actually did a pretty big um, project up there ahead of the flood. Um, a lot of uh, check dams, uh, small retention structures that, um, you know, I think we really made a big difference in uh, in the damage to that neighborhood. So in addition to during the, during the flood, um, I also just wanted to mention a few things uh, that we did um, from the last flood event, um, uh, infrastructure upgrades that also helped the city uh, uh, during this event. Um, some major culverts um, that were replaced uh, after Irene. Um, <clears throat> there's one on Town Hill uh, near Leapfrog Hollow that was upsized, that flooded out in Irene. Um, no damage on, on that. The uh, Berry Street culvert near Lane. That um, reconstructed to, uh, you know, withstand the hundred year flood, um, after Irene, again, no damage there I actually had a request from a resident to inspect that, uh, I mean, about a month before Irene, and we met with the stream alteration engineer and they had some recommendations, you know, just to kind of clean things up. We hadn't gotten to it yet, but regardless of that, that system, uh, completely held up, uh, you know, very well. And then there was a number, number of other areas of bliss road where we did a, a lot of culvert work. Um, out by Cody Chevrolet, there was a, a culvert replaced. Um, that one wasn't didn't hold up perfectly, but it was because of an easement issue. We couldn't do all the work that we wanted to do there. Um, so there was a lot of things done prior to the flood to protect infrastructure, and it was very successful. And a lot of things during uh, done during the flood by our staff um, that really helped minimize the damage in town. So just wanted to, a shout out for the crews of DPW that were out there all night long in the pouring rain. Um, the Spring Street Bridge, we pulled debris out. Uh, with a with a backhoe um, as it started to back up and build up against the, the side of the bridge. So, um, you know, just the, they were doing heroic work out there and um, just want to uh, shout out to the the staff that was um, that was really helping to protect the city. This is great to hear, Kurt. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so glad you were, you outlined all that and explained all of that. I think there are, I, I have heard people saying, where was the city? in those those uh first few days and i'm like there's an answer to that question you just gave a lot of the answer and it's um it's it's easy for people to say oh look at all these problems that happened and how bad things were and they don't necessarily know how much worse things would have been if you hadn't been doing all of that work that you were doing behind the scenes and without us knowing and so thank you so much for doing that it could have been so much worse and i know that you all were tireless literally out there uh, slogging through the mud and doing that and, and i really really appreciate it thank you so much donna yes and i i'd like you to talk a little bit about the wastewater treatment plant there was some work done out there yes um <clears throat> so our chief operator um he actually volunteered to uh, spend the night at the treatment plant because he was just concerned about um, you know, maintaining the infrastructure there. Um, so really, uh, the wastewater plant was was saved. So 
uh, I guess first post Irene, there was a lot of work done. We had some flooding there. Uh, it was actually flooded through uh, a manhole on the a pipe that goes to the river on the, the treated wastewater that goes to the river, the effluent. Um, it backed up through that, came up through a manhole in the, in the facility and flooded the whole uh, lower level. Um, post Irene, there's actually a submarine door installed um, to prevent flood water from entering uh, the, uh, the main admin building. Um, and then during the last upgrade, uh, we went worked with planning to elevate all electrical equipment that we could um, to get our permit to do our work. Um, and um, and so all those areas were elevated. And this event, uh, we actually did not get significant water into the facility. Um, but what we what we did get is a massive amount of flow. Um, so uh, the um, the flow, I think, got up to 10 million gallons per day. Our average is about 1.8 million gallons. So um, I was in contact with um, with Chris during the event. And um, at, at a certain point, we got scared that the, um, the disinfection system, which is uh, ultraviolet lights that are in the channel um, as the water is kind of the last uh, part of treatment, it uh, disinfects the effluent as it leaves the plant. Uh, we did, made a decision to pull that equipment up out of the channels um, because the water was moving so fast that it was in danger of sort of dislodging, um, uh, you know, the system from their racks that they hang from. Uh, the other thing that we did was uh, pull the screen up out of the channel where the uh, wastewater first comes into the plant. There's a trash screen that sort of collects the garbage and everything. Um, again, because the flow is moving so fast, those things, those treatment processes that are actually in the flow line um, are at risk of damage. And so by having staff there and um, moving those things out, we didn't uh, sustain any damage on those. Um, the, the damage that we did get, not really damage, but the impact to the plant was that all of the um, sort of sediment within the collection system washed down into the plant. And there's a, a series of... Um, settlement tanks as part of the treatment process. And um, those all got sort of filled up with silt. And um, during the, during well, immediately after the flood, that silt was sort of getting through the system and all the pumps that moved the wastewater around were um, getting, uh, you know, seized up full of silt. We had to keep pulling those apart and fixing them. Um, <clears throat> and now we have to uh, go through and, and clean all of those tanks, drain them all down one at a time. They're all redundant systems. So you drain one, clean it drain the other one, clean it. Um, so there's still a lot of work to do there. We've started on that process. Um, but, you know, the, it was protected primarily through um, the elevation of the Dog River Road. The wastewater plant is like one of the lowest places in the city, um, but because the Dog River Road sits up so high along the river, it sort of creates a natural dam. And that's one of the projects uh, Mike's looking at is um, May potentially even elevating that through a, a grant program in collaboration with the state to provide further protection from the plant because the wastewater plant is our most expensive asset in the city. Um, I think the value is somewhere close to $80 million. So um, it's very important to, you know, maintain that. And also obviously for the environment, um, it's critical to, to maintain operations there. Um, Kurt, correct me if I get details of this wrong. But one of the other things, for those that aren't aware, uh, the wastewater plant is a biological process. It has, you know, the, the bacteria, the bugs, uh, they call them, that actually eat the germs and things. And am I right? The bugs got washed out, right? We, we yeah. Got... yeah, that's right. I forgot about that piece. Um, right, again, because of the high flows, um, there's uh, bacteria treatment in the, in the aeration tanks that have air, sort of the... Uh, give oxygen to the bugs those wash right out of the plant and um the next day and that does impact the treatment process because um you know the bugs eat the organics the food and the waste um so we got a hold of south burlington uh, i believe it was south burlington and they um the next day we trucked in three loads of bugs and and we're back up and running so it was a very quick turnaround i did thank you bill i forgot about that piece I like the I, the whole idea of trucking in the bugs. I just thought it was great. So thanks. We have South Burlington's bugs in our tanks now. So we, we appreciate it. They also came, by the way, and um, sent a sweeper or two the day after the flood. So we had city of South Burlington vehicles and, and employees down here helping us clean up. So I, I, thanks for that. I really wanted people to understand that because I think there's a little bit of an untold story. 
And I think the other untold story perhaps is the whole story of the hub. Uh, you know, again, to the point of what was the city doing that the, the hub was staffed by the parks department. That was really 100% a city operation led by a volunteer, Peter Walk, and certainly assisted very ably by Montpelier Alive. And we, uh, our emergency team, the mayor, Montpelier Alive, those folks, we were meeting there every day at 11. That was our coordinating point for what people needed. And we were, you know, they would tell us, we'd call the state VOC to get supplies. But, um, you know, I, I'm not trying to take any credit away from Montpelier Alive, but it's it really important. That was pre-planned before the flood that, we would work with them on volunteers. We'd already lined up the parks department and they brought in the entire parks department. Another key piece about this is um, the MYCC people that were people saw running around, those are summer employees of the city. So they aren't just volunteers. And uh, we had one person complain the city hadn't done anything uh, at all to help them. And in fact, uh, the day after the flood, city employees were actually cleaning out their basement, these MYCC people. So it was just kind of, you know, and I think that's fine. It says MYCC, it doesn't say city of Montpelier. I get it. But I think people just don't realize everything the city was doing. Michelle out inspecting all the buildings, the police, everything DPW did. Um, so um, I'm, I'm really proud of our team, that's for sure. Uh, and then the rest of our group was moving the whole city hall operation over to the over to the uh, senior center. So that was going, going on. Uh, about city, so let's talk a little bit quickly about FEMA, just moving on. Uh, we met with, uh, we had a first call with them uh, in terms of not just helping, in, not the parts that you've all heard about, the aid to people, but just our own processing for the city's operations. Um, and we have a, we we're meeting with them, I think on Monday, Monday or Tuesday to, fill out all our forms, kind of go over and make sure they have all our information. So they take every bit of our damages and then they turn them all into individual projects. So for example, after the May 2011 flood, I think we had, 20, we had 75 individual FEMA projects, which is fixing a drain, fixing a street, but they all get listed that way. So we will be sorting all of those out. And then next Thursday, we're meeting for fairly substantial time to go through all the work. So then we'll get a sense of exactly what's covered, what we can do, what we can start. And we're expecting after, and, and so questions we're gonna be asking, we believe that a FEMA recovery officer is covered by FEMA, a flood recovery officer is covered by, to some extent by FEMA funding. So we wanna confirm that so we can bring somebody on to do that work to, to kind of help us navigate the whole FEMA thing. And I was actually, as I was listening to Mike talk, it may be that, you know, that's the kind of person that could help uh, outreach to some, you know, some of these buildings and and provide some of that assistance and knowledge. We'll have to see. Um, and then obviously we're going to get going on our city hall project. So we once we get the go ahead, we're going to release an RFP to get architectural services to help us start uh, planning for what goes where and and all of that. And like everyone else, we'll be elevating our utilities uh, probably to the back of what was the council chambers. Uh, and uh, looking at how to renovate the basement into different uh, configurations. So that is really the single biggest project we have. There is some work to be done um, at the fire station and some work to be done at the police station and a few other uh, smaller project pump stations uh, like that. But our, our single biggest uh, recovery project is City Hall. So those are the things that your city staff is working on. Um, one final thing I have on this list for me, and certainly plenty more for you, is um, city committees. We have a lot of city committees, and obviously it's important that they keep doing work, but they are also staffed, and many of our staff are pretty tapped out. So I think one of our questions was, um, you know, how you all feel if, if some of them get suspended or not, or um, if you have any thoughts about that, or if we... I mean, I think it's important to provide staff support for most committees, maybe they maybe give them the choice. But I wanted to at least raise the issue because we, I didn't feel comfortable single handedly just saying no more committee work or whatever. So there, there are committees, your committees to do work on your behalf. So I um, just wanted to toss that up for conversation. I, th I think I'll jump start by saying, I think that the city staffing for those committees is very important because in years past, 
I think some of our committees were laxer than we should have been at stuff like getting uh, the agendas posted and the minutes posted and uh, all those things. All those city committees are subject to the Open Meetings Act and Public Records Act. So all that stuff has to be done. And that's something that volunteers really can't be expected to do. So uh, so I think it's a, an important function. And I think that uh, it's fine to let some of that not happen while uh, city employees are doing other work. Uh, Donna, you had, did you have your hand up and then Tim? I, I, I did. Um, just a little different point of view. Um, maybe you were saying the same thing, Jack, is that during the pandemic, committees also had staff have to do other things. One, we were so short of people because of everyone we had put on furlough. But I think that it's not the staff that's doing the minutes. It's not the city staff that's doing the posting. And our committees have matured a lot with the records request in open meeting law. And if they run into a snag, they should be able to go to somebody. But I think we should just have the staff talk to each committee and see how maybe this touch base once a quarter or something just to um, you know, keep them on track might be helpful. But I think we have to face reality. They just don't have enough time. No, Tim. My reaction was just still being relatively new at this is how many committees we have. <laughs> it, it, it's a really large number. I, do we have a, like an executive committee, Jack, that maybe could review if we have some key critical committees we want to staff that we need to staff to keep going, we could could do that. And then maybe some of the less, the committees that aren't as active or not as critical could could take a break. We don't have an executive committee, but but it's true. We have a lot of committees and yeah. and, and that means we have a lot of staff, staff time doing it. Uh, and uh, Bill and I didn't think about this before the, tonight's meeting, but we could come up with a list of all the committees because we had it because we we go through every year and make appointments to the committees um, so then that might be a good start uh Helen? uh yeah thank you i understand it's a kind of emergency right we have to pull put all our resources for recovery um but at the same time we should decide if this suspension or let me say getting rid of the committees is that permanent or temporary one? No, we're, only, I mean, we're only talking about temporary, just well. Temporary, we okay. If it is temporary, then if we can tell committee chairs how long you know, we are planning to have this model, then probably they will find a way to do what they are doing by themselves. If they say, oh no, we can't, then for a temporary time, they don't have their meetings, uh, but I think it is important to have these committees. Maybe some of them are not functioning, you know, better than us, uh, but it's a way of public engaging with the city, and it is important. Uh, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I generally um, agree with the approach of um, you know, putting it on the chairs and to the committees, you know, like letting them know, short staffing, um, here's the responsibilities, you know, are you either take a break for some set amount of time, um, even like revisit in a couple months. Um, the only caveat I'm thinking about is, you know, out of this huge public process that we've been going through, there were a lot of like projects and initiatives identified that could be things that these committees could be like ripe uh, entities for picking up and moving forward some community priorities. So that might change somewhat like a committee that's maybe been a little quieter lately might actually have this like new energy to it. So we might want to um, you know, maybe we staff strategically where there's something that there's like a really active that is kind of a emergency response initiative where we can actually get the benefit of these volunteers that have already raised their hand for the community. Um, so that might be the only caveat I put in is if it, if it's like really meeting a, a kind of urgent, timely city need, then putting the staffing in those places as opposed to across the board. Um, and Carrie. 
Yeah, I think it's reasonable for some committees maybe to take a little break um, uh, of a certain amount of time, but um, but I'm reluctant to to say that committees should just. I mean, I, I guess I'm 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 sort of sensing this idea that the committees work is not seen as particularly important and it's expendable. And so if we have to prioritize what we're going to do, then let's drop off the committees. Um, and, and, and if that's true about any committees, then separate from what's going on with the flood, we need to look at that. So if, if the city council decides to create a committee, I think it's because we thought it was important work that needed to be done regardless of what else is going on in the city. And if we have too many committees and we're stretched too thin, then we should really kind of look at that. And I'm definitely open to that idea. But um, I think each individual committee should be thinking about, do we need to keep meeting right now? Can we take a break? Can we meet less often? What, you know, how, how does our work fit into the overall priorities of the city? But to just kind of say a blanket, oh, staff is too busy for committees kind of gives me this sense that committees are being viewed as like extra work on top of the real work that the staff has to do. And if that's if that's really the case, then that's a bigger underlying issue that we, we need to address. So, but, so, I, so I, I just want to say, I appreciate that comment and know that isn't the case, but, uh, and, but keep going. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> so the committees that I'm on, um, there is one of them where we're definitely getting the message from the staff that we shouldn't meet at all anymore because it's just too much, you know, it's not necessary and it's too much work and we shouldn't do it. Um, there's another one where it, it feels like it's kind of fallen down on the staff's priority list. And then, um, and then there's another one that, that is the opposite of that. That's just, you know, going great guns. And so I don't know if that depends on the staff member who's assigned to it or what, but I guess I, I think I would put it, I would turn it back to the chairs of the committees and say, okay, recognizing that staff is very taxed right now, is there work that you can continue to do without staff or maybe with the very minimum input of staff to just you know make, things, make sure that meetings are warned and that kind of stuff? Or maybe you can talk to your staff person and, and not meet for the next month or the next two months or something like that. But the, but but I don't think that we as city council can say anything about what all committees should do. Fair enough. I appreciate that. And actually this is these this feedback is helpful for me to address the, the concerns that have been raised. And I think you're right, Carrie, that um, you know different staff are carrying different loads in the flood response. And so some I think are feeling really overwhelmed because of the particular roles they have. And so th they may be not, whereas other people, you know, I mean, committee work is policy work and that's your, we're here to support that. And so that's, you know, th that is your work and that's what we're here for. Uh, so I, well, I, I'll wait here from Donna, but I think my approach after this conversation is just to go back, look at the committees, talk to the individual staff members. And if there's one or two instances and try to work with that with the chair or you know come back and report to you all but um i i appreciate what you're all saying and donna uh, i guess i've been on a lot of committees without a staff and not every committee has a staff assigned to it and totally functional and when you need a resource or you need their expertise you call them in uh, so many committees do not depend on staff and I think we can get by. We got by and during the pandemic without as much staff support for some of the committees sheer because of time. So I, I think our committees are so full of competent people. I just feel they can function very well. It's not to take away their value at all. In fact, it's putting more value and more responsibility, it's true. But I, I think by and large, um, they can handle it. Um, but it always comes down to the conversation with the committee chair and the committee itself with the staff that's now working with them. Great. There you Thank go. you. Thank you for that feedback. 
So that's basically my list about flood, um, unless there's anything else anybody else wants to talk about. I, it's just kind of all flood all the time. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have a lot of other stuff to talk about. I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to say it all tonight because we will be saying it night after night after night. I don't want to cut anyone off though if they have anything that really is. Yeah, Donna. Oh, you're muted now. Sorry, Donna, you're still muted. My comment, I thought you were like closing the meeting, but I'll save mine for my council report. Oh yeah, I wasn't closing the meeting, okay. okay. But that does bring us to council reports. So let's start with you. Luckily, all my committees took August off. <laughs> um, but really, I, I, the community meetings have been great. I do wish people had more information. It seems we've, we've done a lot of things. I was telling Bill, we, the city's got to brag more about the things they have done in the infrastructure because the public generally does not know. And when we have this newsletter, it's a great communication, but it also needs to be a way to tell people what we're doing in a maybe a little more detail to keep putting in front of the work that the staff is, has done and constant, constantly does. Uh, but uh, my comment was, I really do, here we are, 9.31 and no break. And I feel it's not fair that I have to miss the discussion because I have a limited bladder that you all don't have. And so I really feel we need to go back and say at 8.30, 8.15, we take a break. It's humane, people. It's humane. Okay, that's all I want to say. Thank you. You're right. You're right. I should have listened. I was wrong. Yeah. Um, Carrie. Thanks. Yeah, I just um, want to say that I'm I, uh, I'm sort of personally still immersed in so much of the flood recovery uh -huh. process, um, but that I also know that many of my neighbors and many of the other people in my district are experiencing similar things to what I'm going through and. So I am um, very interested in hearing from folks about what their experiences are and what kind of resources they need and what kind of just in general needs they have that are not being met. And I'm gonna um, hopefully be trying to, to do some of my own research and reaching out to people to find that out. But I also would encourage people to reach out to me and, and share that with me and um, so that we can have a stronger voice about what is needed for support going forward. Thanks, Gary. Uh, Sal. Um, I, I will echo what Donna said about uh, the city uh, do, doing a little more bragging. You know, um, it was great today to, to hear detail on what I knew was happening. I knew things were happening behind the scenes. I didn't know the scale of it. I didn't know the detail. And I heard a lot of folks around town talking about how the city just didn't show up. Um, and it's just, um, I mean, it's great. It's great to have this now, so I can, I can sort of, uh, you know, with some authority, uh, answer those questions. But we really need to tell this, tell a, a better story. And, and you know, Evelyn's been doing a great job. I, I just think we need to get as much information about the kind of planning that we did, the things that that you know were on the checklist that got done. Um, only because they were on the checklist, uh, it would have been so much worse, as, as many of us have said earlier tonight, had the city not uh, been, you know, been active and proactive about it. Uh, but, but so many people in town um, just just don't think of it that way. They that's not what they see. They, you know, they see Montpelier alive, who did a marvelous job, but they were in the forefront and. And the city uh, really took a back seat. And I understand that you know humility can pay off, but in this case, I really think we need to blow our horn a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, thanks for all that effort. Um, and it's still, you know, it's still ongoing, and and people still don't know. So. Right. I did. You'll see if you get your bridge today. Uh, my my article oh, good. Is, is about some of that as much as I could fit in. I mean, it, you know, it's it's kind of it's a simple little thing, but 
you know, it was Montpelier Alive gave us the tents. So all the tents said Montpelier Alive. And I, I think, so it's just one of the, you know, we don't have tents, so we appreciate it. And, you know, Katie was certainly there and working with, I mean, they, I mean, they are essentially one person and she knocked herself out, but, you know, so did the city folks. And um, it, it's just, again, I want to be really careful that we're not trying to in any way take anything away from Montpelier Alive when we talk about this. But I do think that it is also fair to say that that, what happened at the hub would not have happened without the city. Well, it was a real partnership. And I think if we if we present it that way, people understand it that way. Right now, a lot of people don't don't consider right. it that. Maybe we need hats or t-shirts or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, Tim. Thanks. So yeah, it kind of feels like awful lot all the time. So I want to talk about something else. Uh, but it seems like so this evening we set the property tax rate. For this coming year, which it was really significant because that followed a really um, an integrated, expensive citywide reappraisal of all the properties in town, um, and that's going to impact a lot of people in different ways. But all financially, um, we know that the tax year that just ended June thirtieth, we have a deficit. Hopefully, we'll know what the amount of that deficit by our next meeting, um, and then that's followed by this whole flood, which we know we have significant costs coming at us, but we have no idea what they are and how much FEMA will cover. It sounds like we may have a sense of that by the end of September. Um, we're really looking at all this with really significant increases in expenses and revenues in this current year's budget now, um, which didn't contemplate the flood stuff at all because they couldn't. Um, it, it's just feeling like we have a perfect kind of financial storm brewing and I'm really nervous about that. Um, and trying to take a, a, a cue from Kurt and Public Works, I, I think what it really is incumbent on us as a council that we need to commit and gather and, and establish some priorities to start guiding this process because the budget season is going to be here immediately. And um, we have not had those conversations. So I hope we can all commit to, to doing this um, to help get through it. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, Palin. Yeah, again, I want to thank everyone, all the city staff, um, all the great work you have done and you are still doing. Uh, and I understand, again, this is uh, recovery time, it's emergency, so we have to use our resources in a more functional way, but also having our routines is very important too and public needs that too so yeah let's talk about how we can recover let's talk about how we can have better responses next time i hope it doesn't happen but it might right uh, but there are so many things that are happening in addition to flood recovery in our community so we shouldn't forget those things too like senior center there are so many things that are happening members are not happy we have to support them to homelessness right you know I can I can list uh, so many things but I will just stop there so I don't know what the plan is maybe we can come up something that okay some staff will work on the recovery but some of them can also just continue the routine work so people feel uh, that okay this is our community right at least we are going back uh normal um you know faster than we imagine so it will give i think great comfort and secure um security feeling to the public thank you thanks Melan. uh lauren hi thanks and apologies i had to step away are we just doing council reports yes we're at council reports. I had a family issue for a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, no, I just, I, I mean, gratitude. Like, it was really helpful to get this level of detail tonight um, from the city staff, as you all have said. Um, I, and I think just continuing to tell these stories and sounds like on a great track for the capturing lessons learned and some of the ideas about how we um, create 
checklists and things that are going to make it, you know, even better next time. Um, so just just gratitude to the city staff and gratitude to the community who keeps showing up in big ways um, for uh, looking at the future, both kind of immediate response and, you know, visioning what kind of community we want to be, even as we all deal with the very depressing <laughs> reality as we still see our devastated community. So I think it's, you know, it's both a really tragic time and a time for opportunity. So uh, I'm just grateful so many people are showing up for those conversations. So that's it for me tonight. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Mayor's report, I just have a couple of things. One, you know, I I said this when I first went on the council five years ago that we had these tours of all the departments and I was just endlessly impressed by the commitment and the dedication and the professionalism of the uh, of the people that run and staff all of our city departments and uh, and what they do every day to uh, to serve our community and uh, I continue to you know when we when we see a crisis like what has hit us this year it just makes it uh, that that much more obvious that uh, the quality of life that we get from uh, in this city depends in large part on what uh, the the great work that our uh, city employees do and uh, I really praise all of them for what they do I was going to these down at the hub I was going to these uh, meetings every day at 11 o'clock with Bill and Kelly and uh, other departments heads and I never all these things came up and I never heard a city employee say no we can't manage that no we can't do this whatever it was it was a, a constant commitment to do whatever needed to be done to um, to meet the needs of the city um the the other thing that I just wanted to mention is that uh I, we've been doing these meetings remotely, and we can certainly have uh, effective meetings remotely. But uh, but I feel from our experience at this time and our experience during the COVID time that uh, there's great value to also being able to meet uh, in person if we can do it. And so uh, I had this idea today, and I looked at the... Uh, at the school board schedule. And it turns out that the school board has their meetings not on the same nights as, as we have our meetings. And so it made me think, well, maybe we could talk to them and see if we could have our uh, meetings uh, temporarily at, at the high school uh, on nights that they're not having their meetings. And so I'm just curious if, uh, if you all think that that's something we would like to explore because I think it would be, I think there's a real value to doing it. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Great. Okay. Well, Bill and I were talking about that today and we will pursue that. And that's all I've got. Next up, city clerk's report. I'll pass. And city manager's report. Is there anything you haven't already said? Yes, I do. Uh, things that are, are not flood related, and actually they tie into some of the uh, perfectly perfectly timed comments during council report. So, uh, just first of all, high school. Uh, just for those uh, that don't realize, we have done that before. In fact, the last time the elevator went out of service and we were out for several months, we met regularly at the high school and obviously worked with them. And the nice part is they also have the tech set up in the library, it's handicapped accessible. So uh, assuming they'll have us. So the reason we didn't do that immediately after the flood was that they were closed too. They got flooded and so they weren't letting people in. So they, it wasn't an option for us. And uh, so when the mayor mentioned it, we'll be happy to follow up with them. Uh, schools opening, so there shouldn't be any issues with, you know, that kind of thing. So that's good. Uh, the plan is, uh, as per what some of you have said, is starting at our next meeting to get back to some of our backlog of business that has, you know, we've necessarily set aside. I'm sure we can keep a flood update item on the agenda, but for example, 
we'd actually for tonight had planned to have um, the council workshop about the country club road project remember that and uh, so that we don't completely forget that uh, our plan is to have that at the next meeting uh, we've got a couple of item other items that have been getting pushed off so try to get back to normal so you can expect some norm more normal meetings and I think to uh, again the point that a couple of you made and I think Tim in particular are uh, the no, December September 27th meeting the second meeting is supposed to be our strategic planning meeting so that is and I think you know probably was already going to be interesting with three new people and new mayor and all this stuff and now we have this huge um, you know huge flood so I think getting our priorities in order, agreed upon, uh, laid out our work plan and dealing with some of our issues will be really important. Uh, working on getting a facilitator for that meeting, uh, just so we can have, you know, the mayor and I or whoever doesn't don't have to manage the meeting, we can all participate um, and, and do that. And that's that's worked well in the past. And then the following meeting would have actually been the follow up strategic planning meeting and then actually correctly speaking starting to talk about budget preview so uh it's it's timely that we get back to that um and particularly under the circumstances we really need to sort out all our pieces and see where, where we're at so just laying the groundwork that uh we too are of the same mind as you that um so that's that's where we're going. That's all I had. Um, yeah, that was all I had. Okay. I think we are set then, and we can be in adjournment at 9.46 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you. Right. See you next time. <laughs>